Dead Man's Hand, a Corey Sloan Witch Mystery, Corey Sloan Witch Mysteries Book 2, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Megan Kelly. Chapter 1 Just light the candle, Corey! I took a deep breath and gave the candlestick across the room the hairy eyeball. I'll catch the curtains on fire again. Chaos, my arctic fox familiar, shook her head in exasperation. Then you'll put them out again, then make them good as new. Practice is practice. Look at it as an exercise in crisis management. Cat, my roommate, came bouncing down the stairs and groaned when she saw what was going on. Not the candle thing again. Why does it have to be fire? I'm allergic. Don't be a baby, Chaos said, rolling her emerald eyes. You're not allergic. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I am. Just like I'm allergic to wooden stakes and anything that can decapitate me. My body has an adverse reaction to being dead. Thanks for the vote of confidence, bestie, I said, wiping my sweaty palms on my jeans. To be fair, I couldn't blame her. As a vampire, fire was not her friend, and I didn't exactly have a good track record with this particular spell. I have confidence in you, she hedged. But maybe lighting the candle isn't the best trick to practice inside. You know, just in case. I raised an eyebrow at her. You mean just in case I ignite the drapes rather than the candle like I've already done a half a dozen times? She nodded as she reached into the fridge for a box of faux blood. Yep, that's exactly what I mean. It's not like I could blame her, since she'd passed on a cerulean amulet that helped me separate my witchy powers from my werewolf ones. My magic had improved in leaps and bounds, but I still had problems with spells that required finesse. We were both still getting used to the fact that Chaos, the adorable little black and white marble fox I'd found in the woods as a baby, was much more than just a furry face that bummed food and hogged couch pillows. The minute I'd slipped the amulet on, she'd become my familiar. My bossy, sarcastic, demanding familiar. From what I could understand, she'd always been my familiar, but I'd needed the crystal to open up my magic so she could step up. Chaos had much more faith in me than I did in myself, which I supposed was a good thing. I had to agree with Cat, though. Fire was an outside toy until I got a firm handle on it. You're almost 30 years old and haven't mastered some of the most basic spells. My dragon and fox clothing pointed out, her fluffy black and white tail wrapped around her feet. I'm aware, I said after I drank half my bottle of water in one go. But I'm also aware that poor Cat doesn't deserve to have her home burned down around her, or worse yet, on her. As I strive for proficiency... Besides, we've been at this for three hours. It's almost dark. Fine, Chaos said, hopping down from the ottoman she'd been ruling from and heading for the couch. I'm ready for a nap anyway. I smiled, glad that some things hadn't changed. As she curled up between two pillows on the couch and closed her eyes, I went to join Cat while she had her breakfast. To me, it was way past supper time, so I scrounged in the fridge and came out with some leftover pizza. Rather than heat it up, I opted to just eat it cold. The werewolf half of me wasn't particular when I was hungry. Plus, cold pizza was like fried chicken. It was just as good cold as hot. Well, almost. Cat smiled as she took a pull of synthetic A positive from the straw sticking out of what we jokingly called her juice box. I know I tease you, but you've come a long way in a short amount of time. I lifted a shoulder as I chewed, then swallowed. Thanks. At least I knew the basics before, even if I couldn't manage them. Now that it all works, it's more a matter of refining what I know. Even when I have trouble mastering something, I scowled at her when she coughed fire into her hand. I know once I figure it out, it'll work every time. 
Before Cat had given me the amulet several weeks prior, I had never known when my magic would work and when it wouldn't. My werewolf magic interfered with my witch magic and made it wonky. The amulet served to help me separate the two. My spells were always a magical roll of the dice. And as Castle Bluff's sheriff and the leader of the local pack, the last thing I could do was show that kind of weakness. Charlotte seems to have a lot to offer you, too, Cat said, taking a seat beside me at the table. She's a good resource to have for more reasons than one. She wasn't wrong. Charlotte was a witch who was close friends with Sean, and when he'd helped me out of a sticky situation a few weeks back, he'd offered to have her tutor me. That was right about the time I'd gotten my amulet. Now that my witch powers weren't muted and distorted by my werewolf side, I found I needed help more than ever, but for different reasons. I sometimes felt like I was riding a bicycle with no brakes, and Charlotte was helping me learn control as well as teaching me spells and, for lack of a better word, tricks. Like lighting a candle from across the room just by willing it to happen. My mom, who was also a powerful witch, had offered, but we couldn't even work together when I needed help with my homework. Butting heads seemed to be what we did best. Besides, she was all the way up in North Carolina. Charlotte's been a lifesaver, I agreed. It was great of Sean to hook us up. I'm sure it helps having Chaos and Alex, too, she said, sucking the last of her breakfast out of the bottom of the box. I'm glad you have a support system to help you adjust. Let me tell you, it makes all the difference in the world. I took a big drink of tea to wash down my pizza. It does, and don't forget yourself in there. I don't know what I'd do without y'all around to coach me. Cat was a vampire, but she had her own brand of magic and had shared with me what she knew. She was also my head cheerleader, which was more important to me than she realized. A shadow crossed her face, and I knew she was thinking back to her own first few months as a vampire. She'd woken up in an alley with no memory of who she was or what had happened to her. She wouldn't go into details about those first couple of weeks, but a vampire high in the ranks took her in, protected her, and taught her what she needed to know in order to survive and thrive in her new reality. That vampire, Sean Castle, went on to found our town. Castle's Bluff was an interesting mix of folks. Sean had won the land in a poker game and built the town with the intent of it being a pocket community for paranormals, but when humans inevitably found it, it wasn't like we had a way to keep them out. So, magic went back in the closet, and law enforcement, and life in general, became much more complicated. Don't get me wrong, people were people, and I didn't care whether they shifted, cast spells, drank blood, or just hung out and drank beer. Or sweet tea, as was typical in any town south of the Mason-Dixon line. My little slice of Georgia was no exception. Fried chicken, sweet tea, and manners were as much a part of life as humidity and potholes. The only downsides to having humans under my watch were that they were fragile, and they weren't nearly as open-minded a species as the rest of us were. Living in the magical closet sucked but it beat being studied in some lab or starting a war humans were sure to lose. Not all of them were clueless, though. A portion of the town knew the deal, and many more suspected, but chose to swallow our often flimsy explanations because it was easier than admitting magic and fairy tale creatures were real. Thankfully, the humans closest to me knew what was up, so I didn't have to come up with bogus excuses when I used my gifts to do my job or heat up a cold cup of coffee. I'd just stuffed the last piece of crust in my mouth and was brushing my hands off when my phone rang. I wiped my hands on my jeans and pulled it from my pocket. It was Sam, my second-in-command at the sheriff's office. Hey, Sam, I said as a finger of foreboding slid down my spine, causing goosebumps to pop up on my arms. What's up? He took a deep breath, then released it. We have a body in the alley behind the hook. So far, no witnesses, and he's not carrying any identification. Great. 
We'd just gotten everything put to rights after a rogue werewolf tried to start a turf war by killing people a couple of months before. The last thing we needed was another murder to send folks back behind locked doors. This was my town, and I wanted my people to feel safe. Please tell me it's not an animal attack, I said. That would be a worst-case scenario, because pack politics were still touch and go between my pack and an isolationist pack on the coast. Even though relationships were improving because their leader and I were working together to mend fences and change old beliefs, there was still much work to be done. Nope, Sam said. It looks like he was shot. There is something odd, though. He sniffed, and I could see him take his sheriff's department ball cap off, run his hand through his hair, then slide the cap back into place. It's what he did when he was agitated. Well... What is it? I asked, prodding him to get on with it. He's holding a hand of cards, aces and eights to be exact. Dead man's hand, I said, my mind flipping through a dozen different scenarios. No matter which one I picked, none of them were good. It was going to be a long night. Chapter 2 by the time I got to the scene, darkness had fallen. Sam had the area cordoned off and had parked his truck sideways to block off one end of the alley from the looky loos but they'd just gathered on the other end. The dead guy was sprawled across the middle of the alley, and the space was so tight that, had I parked my jeep there to block the scene from that end, the EMTs wouldn't have been able to maneuver the gurney around it to get him out of there. Hey, Corey. Lila, the owner of the donut shop, called as I ducked under the tape. Who is it? And do you know who offed him? I scowled at her. You've been watching too many old mobster movies. Nobody said he was offed anyway. Could be his ticker gave out. I should have known better than to respond because the crowd went wild. So many questions zinged at me that they all ran together. But they were all variants of the ones she'd asked. Except one. I took a deep breath and scrubbed a hand over my face. Corey, do you reckon it was aliens? One of the Johnson twins, either Raymond or Robert, I couldn't tell which one, yelled. I reached deep for my patience, but his brother slapped him down before I got the chance to. Course it wasn't no aliens, you idiot, he said, elbowing him and glowering. It wasn't even dark yet. They ain't gonna do nothing in the middle of town, in daylight. Of course, because that was the only logical reason why aliens didn't kill random guy number one in an alley in central Georgia. I massaged my forehead as I approached the body, the sounds of their bickering making me shake my head. Fortunately, the classic rock pouring out the back door of the rusty hook was loud enough that it drowned them out as I moved closer to the body. What do we have? I asked, bending down to look at the guy. Thank goodness for werewolf vision, because the watery glow from the streetlight didn't do much. That was to our advantage, though, because it also limited what the onlookers could see. Sam rubbed the back of his neck, then took off his sheriff's office ball cap and shoved an errant hank of salt and pepper hair back before slapping it on again. Jenna from the bookstore found him 20 minutes ago or so. He lowered his voice. I'm guessing he's a vamp, ice cold, and look how pale he is. Or maybe he's just been here for a while. I squatted down to get a closer look. The guy was wearing a custom-tailored charcoal vest, and a bullet hole about the size of a quarter had torn a hole in the fabric right over his heart. From the lack of blood on the asphalt, I assumed it was small caliber. Nope, Sam answered. He hasn't been here more than an hour. Even though the music was loud enough to drown out his words to humans, Sam kept his voice low so supernatural ears would have a harder time hearing him. Jenna said she was back here for a smoke a half hour or so before she found him, and he wasn't here then. I guess he could have been dumped, though. She's in the store. I told her to lock up and wait for us there so the vultures wouldn't hassle her. I mulled his theory over in my head. Bullets don't kill vampires. 
I said, leaning forward to feel his skin. I used the pretense of checking for a pulse, even though a blind man could have seen that he was dead as a doornail. Normally, I could tell whether he was human or vamp by his scent, but the smell of cologne was so thick I tried to breathe through my mouth. Good Lord, when were people going to realize that stuff was supposed to be spritzed on, not bathed in? As soon as I touched him, the world around me disappeared and I was pulled into a vision. A feeling of recognition washed over me, then surprise and a starburst of pain. The last details I picked up before losing the final wisps of the vision was a black floor rushing toward my face as I fell forward and the toe of a black lace-up boot in the peripheral once I landed. It was sort of like I was looking through a camera that had been dropped on its side, then it went black. What did you see? Sam asked, his lined brown eyes both curious and concerned. I sighed. Not much. I relayed the bits I'd gotten. And either I didn't get any sound, or there wasn't any. Hard to believe since he was shot. I'd had visions all my life, and even with the crystal, they were still wonky. It wasn't like I could practice having them. Great, he said. So we're looking for somebody wearing black work boots. We'll have this buttoned up in no time. Well, I said, and he knew his killer. At least it's something. One of the man's hands was draped across his stomach, and the other was sprawled beside him. That was the one holding the cards. His fingers were relaxed, but four of the cards were tucked in between them and his thumb. The other was lying face down on the asphalt between his hand and his body. Sure enough, as Sam had said, he was holding the ace and eight of spades and the ace and eight of clubs. Because of his position, I couldn't see the fifth card without picking it up. I didn't want to do that before Colleen, our M.E., and C.S.I. had a chance to do her thing. The coroner's van pulled in, and a low grumble rose from the crowd when it obstructed their view. I was glad to see her. She was good at her job, and I had no doubt she'd have more information for me before they took the body away. Colleen and Sam both knew all about the less human side of our community. Sam had known me all my life. He'd grown up with my mom. Colleen had known me almost that long, though she'd been brought into the secret later. Once she took the coroner's job, she sort of had to be clued in, for obvious reasons. I turned to Sam as the petite blonde grabbed her black bag of tricks from the back of the black county van. Did you find out who he is yet? I know you said he wasn't carrying a wallet, but has anybody recognized him? He shook his head. Not yet. I haven't had a chance to talk to anybody. So maybe a robbery gone bad then? For some reason, that didn't sit right with me, though. Somebody just interested in his cash wouldn't have taken the time to stuff cards in his hand. There was nothing left to do with the scene or the body until Colleen was finished and had at least a preliminary report, so Sam and I headed into the bookstore to talk to Jenna, a teenager who worked there part-time. He rapped on the back door, and it took a few seconds for it to open just wide enough for me to see a flash of pink before a high-pitched voice asked who was there. The girl's fuchsia hair was bright, even through the crack, her brown eyes large behind a pair of bedazzled glasses. It's just us, Sam said. She let out a breath and pushed the door open for us, shooting a glare toward the looky-loos at the end of the alley as she did so. I've known most of those people all my life, but now it's like a Walking Dead episode. They're looking in the windows and pounding on the glass. Lordy, what's wrong with them? Everybody loves a good murder, and right now, you're the best one to dish with. I scowled, irritated that folks had acted like that. They knew better, and I'd call them out on it when I gave a statement. I'd found a little public shaming went a long way toward reminding folks to mind their manners, and I wasn't above using it to get the poor girl some peace. It wasn't like she was going to have much. Finding a dead body in an alley wasn't quite the fodder for fairy tale dreams. I pushed the door shut and took a breath before I turned to question a teenager about a dead body. I added that to the list of sins I was holding the killer accountable for.
Chapter 3 The bookstore was one of those that sold a variety of books, everything from the latest mysteries to ancient tomes on werewolf history, though those were kept in the fiction section, right alongside the fairy tales and science fiction books. I'd always been a bookworm, so the smell of old paper combined with new added a layer of comforting warmth to the place. Jenna led us to one of the several arrangements of comfortable armchairs meant to encourage a customer to sit and read, and we took a seat. I leaned forward with my elbows on my knees. I know this has been tough, sweetie, so we'll be quick. What time was it when you found the body? She pushed her glasses up the bridge of her nose, then smoothed her plaid miniskirt just to have something to do with her hands. About eight, right before closing time. I was taking the trash out and saw him lay in there. I thought maybe he'd gotten a snootful at the hook and passed out, so I went over to try to wake him up. She cringed, her eyes staring somewhere over my shoulder. Then I saw the hole in his vest and felt for a pulse. When I didn't find one, I called 911. The poor girl was almost as pale as the guy in the alley, and I felt horrible for her. And what time was it when you went out to have a smoke? Oh, it really wasn't a smoke. It was just a clove cigarette, she rushed to say. Real cigarettes will kill you. Okay, I said, trying not to roll my eyes. What time was that then? Around 7.30. I know because I was counting down to closing time. It's been a slow day, and the time felt like it was dragging. I'd imagine she'd have been much happier if it had ended that way, too. And you're positive he wasn't there then? Sam asked. Positive, she said, nodding. I was on the phone with my friend Tara, and I pace when I talk. I walked over that spot a half dozen times. Her eyes darted between us. If you could leave the phone part out when you talk to Miss Clancy, I'd appreciate it. I'm not supposed to do that but I was so bored. I can't imagine it'll come up when we talk to her, I said. I'd known Darlene Clancy my whole life. Before she'd bought the bookstore, she'd been a substitute teacher when I was in school and was a real ball breaker. No need to put the kid through any more hell than she'd already been through. Did you touch anything? Sam asked. Other than just his neck when you felt for a pulse? Nope she said, shaking her head. As soon as I realized he was dead, I ran back into the store and locked the door, she frowned. Being that close to a dead body freaked me out, and I was scared who'd ever done it was still around. But they weren't. I watched her face for any sign of lying or hesitation, but she didn't miss a beat. Nope, the alley was empty. I was paying close attention because I didn't want to get busted smoking. Even if I might only be working here for another couple weeks, seeing as how it's been sold and they might tear it down, which Mama says. She realized she was starting to babble and snapped her mouth shut. The poor kid ran a hand through her bubblegum hair, causing it to stand on end, and plucked at the hem of her skirt, eyes downcast. I feel like I should have tried CPR or something. I leaned toward her and caught her gaze. Sweetie, there was nothing you could have done to help. He was way past that, so don't go feeling guilty. You sure? She blinked several times, fighting back tears. I was a little surprised it had taken her that long to get to that point. She'd held it together well until then. Positive. I told her, nodding. I glanced askance at Sam to see if he had any other questions, but he shook his head and stood. Do you want me to call your mama to come get you? He asked. Nah, she's already at work, and I'm fine. Really, Jenna said, drawing in a deep breath as she stood to see us out. Do I, like, need to stay in town or anything? I gave her a half smile. You're not a suspect. But are you planning to go somewhere? No, except maybe out to the lake. They just always say that on TV, so I wanted to make sure I was good. You know, just in case. You're good, 
Sam said, giving her a pat on the shoulder as we stepped out the back. We'll call if we have any more questions. Come on, we'll walk you to your car. That'd be awesome, she said, casting another cranky glare toward the crowd. I feel like I'm jumping into a piranha tank out there. She stepped back inside, grabbed her purse from a cubby, shut off the lights, and locked the back door before squaring her shoulders and turning around. She made it a point to look anywhere but toward the body as we walked away from the scene and around my jeep to where her car was parked. As expected, the crowd went wild when they saw her, and Jenna cringed. I turned and shot them a blistering glare, making eye contact with several of the ones I knew were high on the gossip and social food chains. Most of them had the good grace to look away, but the ones who didn't got an elbow to the ribs. They were good folks whipped into a frenzy by what, in our town, was a big deal. Once the initial shine wore off, they'd realize she was just a kid and leave her alone. She'd probably enjoy celebrity status with her peers for a while, but that was different. Once we saw her off, we headed back toward the body, squeezing between the fence and the county van to get back to the crime scene. Colleen pushed to her feet and pulled off one glove, then snapped the other one down around it, inside out, and brushed off her hands. Her gray eyes were shrewd as she looked at the scene as a whole, taking in every detail. I can't tell whether or not he was killed here, she said. And it's hard to tell how long he's been dead, considering he's a vamp and I can't go by body temp. I snapped my gaze away from the body toward her and furrowed my brow. How can he be a vamp? Bullets don't kill vamps, she shrugged. I won't be able to answer that until I get him back to the morgue, but I checked his canines. Definitely a vampire. I huffed a breath out between my cheeks. Great. That meant I had a whole other level of crazy to deal with. Not to be callous, but from a legal standpoint, a murdered shifter or human would have been easier. The investigation would have been completely within my department with no outside involvement. With vamps, I'd have to deal with the Archaic Vampire Council. In this case, the regional director was a great guy, but great was a subjective term when you were dealing with a vampire who was hundreds of years old. That many years of immortality tended to warp a person's perspective of the here and now, sometimes for the better, but not always. I pinched the bridge of my nose because I knew this situation was going to fall into the latter category, given that the regional leader was also the town's founding father. Sean Castle was not going to be pleased, and since he happened to be in residence, I couldn't even put off telling him until I knew more. Good thing it was already night. Otherwise, I'd have considered taking up day drinking. Chapter 4 Before I'd left, I'd remembered to ask Colleen what the fifth card was. It had me stymied because it was a joker. I'd expected it to be a jack of diamonds because even though the facts were fuzzy, the most common belief was that it was the fifth card in the dead man's hand. So named because it was the poker hand Wild Bill Hickok was holding when he was murdered from behind. It wouldn't have stood out as much if they'd chosen another random card, but I had to believe the Joker was a deliberate choice. I tapped my finger on the steering wheel of the Jeep on my way to Sean's, mulling over what it may mean. In a regular deck of cards, it was a wild card. When used, it was the highest trump card, turning a crappy hand into one that can take a pot. In that case... It could have meant anything from nanny nanny boo boo, I win because you're dead, to you were too dumb to live. There was also the tarot angle to consider too. My Aunt Carol was precognitive and used cards as one of the tools to target her thoughts when she was shooting for something specific. The problem with tarot, though, was that the cards could be fickle, and they were almost always open to interpretation. Typically, though, the Joker or fool as it was called, implied a situation in flux. Change, unrealized potential, mystery, 
or even bluffing. Beginnings, endings, it all depended on the cards around it, or, in this case, what it meant to the murderer. Whether the killer meant the card literally or figuratively was another point to consider. Or, and it was just as plausible, the murderer just wanted to leave a cool, mysterious calling card, pun intended, or was a delusional Batman fan. Long story short, for the time being, the only function the card was serving was in its most base interpretation. It was fooling with me. When I pulled up in front of Sean's antebellum mansion, the place was lit up like a Christmas tree. Expensive cars lined the brick drive, and Vivaldi's spring concerto was floating on the breeze. He'd hosted a Fourth of July party a few weeks back, and he'd had a classic rock cover band. He was complex and eclectic. You never knew what you were going to get with him. I took the porch steps two at a time and shook my head when I saw people in fancy dress waltzing around the grand front parlor. I picked up the lion head knocker and wrapped it against the brass plate and Sean's butler answered the door. The guy looked like he had chronic constipation and for whatever reason, I wasn't one of his favorite people. Sheriff Sloan? He said in a tone that most people used when they smelled dog poop. Jeeves? I replied with a cheeky grin. He ground his teeth at the nickname, but I waved it off as if I didn't know I was tap dancing on a nerve. Good to see you as always. Your bow tie's a bit askew. I'd never accept that from my own butler, but Sean has a good heart. Speaking of, I need to speak with him. I tried on numerous occasions to get the stick in the mud to warm up to me, but he never would and always wore that air of stodgy condescension that frankly irritated me. So I'd given up and started giving as good as I got. Master Castle is entertaining. Huh, I said, looking around at the fancy cars and twinkle lights and doing my best to hang on to my patience. You don't say. I thought maybe he'd started a high-end used car lot. My nerves were frayed, and I wasn't in the mood to deal with his high-hattedness. I gave up the pretense and cut to the chase. Look, I'm not playing the little bullshit dance we usually go through tonight. Go get him, or I'm going in. His eyes flashed silver, and I let my wolf send him a glimmer of green right back. Cordelia? What's going on? I cringed at the use of my given name. Only my mother and sometimes this guy, called me that. Sean Castle stepped into the foyer toward us as the last strains of the concerto drifted away. He was wearing a tailored black tux with a scarlet pocket square, and the expression on his handsome late thirty-ish face was a combination of confusion and consternation. He knew he'd walked in on a pissing match. I'm here to see you on official business. I said, maintaining eye contact with the butler. But as usual, Jeeves here seems to think that what I have to say doesn't merit dragging you away from your party. Sean lowered his brows at the butler, and the amiable expression shifted seamlessly to one of ruthlessness. We've discussed this, have we not? It was a simple miscommunication, I assure you. The pompous jerk answered, bowing his head and averting his eyes. I was about to announce her when you appeared. I snorted. He'd been about to introduce me to his fangs, more like. Despite my age and sex, that would have been a miscalculation on his part. I pushed past him, mentally over the whole thing. Is there somewhere we can talk? I asked Sean. Of course. He said, concern lining his face. Follow me. He led me around a fancy curved staircase and down a hallway into a private study, sliding the pocket door shut behind us. He poured two glasses of scotch from a crystal decanter and handed me one. I wasn't about to turn that down after the day I'd had. Though he was quite modern for a man nearly a thousand years old, he was still an old-school gentleman and offered me a chair in front of a fireplace before taking one himself. 
I took a sip from my glass and savored the smoky richness as I watched the flames flicker over the logs. You could say a lot about the ancient vampire, but never let it be said he served inferior booze. So, he said, swirling the amber liquid in his own glass. What brings you by? Not pleasure, I'm sorry to say. We had a murder tonight. Or rather, we found a body tonight. We're not sure yet how long he's been dead. We're not sure he was killed there. He went stiff and asked for more details. I told him what I knew, then pulled up a picture of the victim on my phone. He took it, and his jaw clenched when he saw it. I had no idea who the guy was to him, but he was obviously somebody important. He handed the phone back to me, then, with the preternatural speed of his species, he was staring out a window several feet away. His name is... was... Charles Vanderveer, he said, his expression brooding. I could feel the tension rolling off of him. He was a dear friend of mine from way back, and he was staying here. On a longer vacation, or just for the ball? I asked, surprised at his reaction. He tended to be uber laid back. My mom called him irreverent and cavalier, but I'd known him long enough to learn that underneath that veneer was a complex man who could go from generous to murderous in a heartbeat. He had an overdeveloped sense of fair play, though, so we got along well, even though we didn't always agree on paranormal politics. I was afraid those differences in opinion were going to cause some rough sailing for us in the days ahead. I'm hosting a high-stakes poker tournament this weekend. The ball was one of the events leading up to it. Charles arrived last week and was going to stay for a month or so before heading back to Seattle. A haunted smile tipped the corner of his mouth. He liked to come and play the role of a southern rake. It was all in good fun. Until it wasn't, anyway. When was the last time you saw him? I asked. He thought for a few seconds. We went riding this afternoon and then had tea. So, perhaps four. He said he was going to town for a bit to soak up some of the local ambiance. That usually meant going to Sully's or The Hook. The Hook was our local dive bar and often had poker games going on in the back. But since we'd found him behind Sully's, I'd start there. Do you know if he carried a wallet? Because he wasn't when we found him. Sean's brow furrowed. Yes, he did. He never had less than a few thousand dollars on him. He said you never knew when an opportunity would pop up. What an odd expression. What sort of opportunity? The corners of his mouth tipped up in a ghost of a smile. Charles would bet on quite literally anything. Cards, sports, drag races, ponies, behavior, even the exact height or weight of a person. It didn't matter to him, but he rarely bet on something he couldn't win. Was that due to luck or because he was in the habit of putting his finger on his side of the scale? If he was a cheat, that made for one hell of a motive. Sean rubbed his chin, his forehead crinkled in thought. To be honest... I've asked myself the same question dozens of times over the years. I never caught him cheating, nor has anybody else, but he did have exceptional luck. Whether he was just a masterful cheat, a shrewd thinker, or simply lucky, or a combination of the three, is anyone's guess. The only question I had left was the obvious one. Can you think of anybody who'd want him dead? He huffed a derisive breath out through his nose. Though Charles is one of my nearest and dearest friends, he was an acquired taste and had some habits that tended to land him on the wrong side of people, namely husbands, and jilted women, and fellow poker players. A real stand-up guy, then. It would have been easier to ask who wouldn't want to kill him. I ran my tongue over my teeth. Can you narrow that down a little? Anybody recent, or maybe somebody who's here for the tournament? He turned away from the window and reclaimed his seat in the chair near me, staring into his glass. 
Can you give me until tomorrow to reconcile myself with this death and to gain some clarity? Maybe then I'll have some ideas for you. I need to collect myself and organize my thoughts and speak to my guests. Coffee at Joe's tomorrow morning at 8? I'd rather not talk here. What we need to discuss needs to be private. I wasn't a fan of him speaking to his guests without me, but from the look of things, he probably had 50 people in the house. He was shrewd and not much got past him. I'd do it his way, for now. I dipped my head and finished my scotch. Joe's tomorrow at 8. I'll see you then. And I may have more answers for you by then, too. Standing, I studied him for a second. He was lost in thought, swirling his scotch and watching it as if it held the answers to life's greatest questions. I'll show myself out. I hadn't made it two steps after I closed the doors before Crystal crashed against the wall from inside the study. Whoever killed Charles Vanderveer had better hope they didn't get caught because I wasn't sure I could protect them or that I'd even want to. Chapter 5 I'd just made it home and kicked off my shoes when Colleen called. Hey, Colleen. Any news? Actually, yeah. He wasn't shot like we thought he was. He was stabbed, or more accurately, impaled. I let that soak in. It made more sense than a shooting, but the hole in his shirt was round. With what? From what I can tell, some sort of wooden dowel. There were a couple of splinters in his ribs. The hole in his chest is about an inch across and whatever they used went straight through his heart. I pulled the scrunchie from my hair and ran my fingers through my tresses, scowling when I hit a couple snags. Well, at least that's explained then. Any ideas as to what the weapon may have actually been? None yet. I did an analysis on the splinters. I can tell you what kind of wood it is, maple, but that's about it. That wouldn't do any good until we had more details, but it would be another nail in the coffin, so to speak, once we had either a suspect or a murder weapon. Maple was used to make everything from tables to picture frames. Thanks, Colleen. I know it's late, and I appreciate that you stayed and worked on it. Any idea how long he'd been dead? Considering he was sort of already dead before somebody killed him, not really. I can't use any of my standard methods to determine that. I was afraid you were going to say that. Go home and get some rest. Anything else will wait till morning. I disconnected with her and called Sam. I knew I was going to have to call my mom at some point, too, but I was putting it off. She took the interfering mother role to the nth degree, and I needed a fresh head and a longer fuse if I had to deal with her. Tomorrow would be soon enough. Sam needed to know what I'd learned, though, so I flipped through my contacts and called him. He answered, and I gave him a rundown of my conversation with Colleen and filled him in on my visit to Sean's. Sean saw him at around four yesterday afternoon. It seems they were close, and he wanted time to collect himself and talk to his guests. I'm meeting him at Joe's in the morning. He paused. You sure you want to let him question his guests without you there, kiddo? Isn't that sort of giving them a heads up? I rolled my head on my shoulders in an attempt to ease the tension in my neck. They'll hear about it anyway. To be honest, they're probably more scared of him than they are of me, so they'll be less prone to lie and more apt to share information with him. Plus, he is the head of the Regional Vampire Council. I'm going to have to involve him anyway. How much of a problem are they going to be? The scotch had left a warm glow in my belly, but it was wearing off. I loved my fast metabolism most of the time, but right then, it would have been nice for the edges of reality to be a bit fuzzy. It depends. I don't think it would be such a big deal if Sean weren't close to the guy, because he wasn't exactly a well-loved member of the community. Since he is, though, we may have a problem. Sean has a lot of power and long arms. 
If we're the ones to find the guy, he'll have to cooperate, at least to a certain degree. If he finds him, it's possible we won't even know. Sam paused, thinking. When you sit down with him tomorrow, try to work something out with him. Get ahead of it. If I've learned anything about Sean Castle in the 50 years I've known him, it's that he's a man of his word. You're plugged in here, and he's not. Vamps may be more willing to talk to him, but that's the extent of his power. It's not like he can go around questioning non-paranormals, and even most of the witches and shifters in the area aren't going to talk to him over you. He was right. Regardless of our diversity, my little town was still a small southern town. We circled the wagons when something like this happened, and most folks weren't inclined to talk to outsiders. And even though he'd founded the town, Sean Castle was definitely an outsider. He drifted in once a decade or so and stayed for a few months or a year, but he didn't have any real roots here. Thanks, Sam. Sure thing, kiddo. I'll see you in the morning. Don't stay up chewing on this all night. I smiled. He knew me too well. I won't. I'm beat. I'll talk to you tomorrow. After we hung up, I poured myself a glass of wine and headed to the living room. Chaos stood up on the couch, then leaned back on her haunches in a stretch, yawning. Did you catch all that? I asked as I plopped down in my favorite overstuffed chair and pulled my feet up underneath me. I heard what you said, but I have no clue what you were talking about. Sounds like a hot steaming mess, though, if the vampire council's involved. Fill me in. I did, careful not to leave anything out. If I'd learned anything about her since we'd started communicating, it was that she was sharp as a tack and was hardwired for logistical thinking. That, and she thought about food almost as often as I did. She was quiet for a few seconds after I quit talking. If that's a vampire, you know it falls under Sean's jurisdiction. And there was the rub. I was the liaison between paranormals and non-paranormals, though most humans were clueless and didn't realize that. Whereas most shifter laws fell more into line with human ones, aside from violent crimes, vampire law was, by necessity, harsh. Humans debated the morality of the death penalty, but in the vampire world, it was a necessity. Immortality had a way of going to some people's heads, and most of the serious crimes were against humans. Whereas in the human world, criminals frequently got away, that wasn't the case in the paranormal world. Between the inevitability of getting caught and the promise of death, even the worst vampires tended to behave themselves. My problem, though, was that I'd been pushing to get the council to work with me rather than parallel to me, because as it was, most vampires didn't recognize my authority when it came down to brass tacks. That needed to change, because my laws applied to everybody, and I was going to enforce them equally, regardless of species. Chaos ran her nails through her tail, brushing the fur until it was fluffy. How are you going to explain this to the rest of the town if the killer turns out to be a vampire? I mean, they're going to want to see justice done. They'll expect an arrest and trial. And if it's not a vampire, how are you going to keep Sean from killing them? I rub my face. I have no idea. Those are problems for future me. Present me just wants to sip her wine, take a bath, and go to bed. Not to go all Scarlet O'Hara, but I've hit saturation for the day. I'll sleep on it and make some decisions in the morning. She jumped onto my lap and nuzzled her head against my chest. It'll be all right, Corey. It always is. We'll figure it out. I hoped with all my heart she was right, but the realist in me reminded me I was dealing with the Vampire Council. Their idea of all right could end up being vastly different than mine. Chapter 6 Despite the events of the day, I slept hard and awoke feeling halfway decent again. 
I beat Sean to Cup of Joe's by ten minutes, so I took that time to sip on my first latte of the day and do some eavesdropping. I chose a table in the back of the cafe, and people watched while I waited. The smell of cinnamon and the rich flavor of white chocolate in my cup of caffeine were sheer heaven, and I kicked back to relax and hear what was to be heard. Of course, the murder was all anybody was talking about, so I hoped to pick up something useful. You'd be amazed what you could learn if you were willing to listen, especially when you were sitting in one of the town's two gossip factories. Mabel Bennett owned the beauty shop, and it had held court for more than 50 years. But when Joe's opened 20 years ago, it became a secondary hub because it had the added benefit that men could join in on the fun. Mona was the queen of the place. If you've ever watched Mel's Diner, picture Flo, and you have a decent picture of Mona right down to the apron, though with a bottle blonde beehive rather than red. The air was full of speculation, and I focused on separating the wheat from the chaff, if such a thing was even possible. I heard he was playing poker in the back of Sully's right before it happened. One older guy dressed in overalls said to his buddy. No, his friend said, shaking his head so that the light glinted off his bald spot. He'd been at the hook drinking. There wasn't even a game going at Sully's last night. A group of women were clucking away like a flock of old hens a couple of tables down. He was with that Carly Sue Barker over at the hook last night. A soccer mom wearing jeans and a Gap t-shirt said, her wide, Botoxed eyes reflecting the judgment reserved for those righteous few fortunate enough to be better than everybody else. I heard that too, her fellow soccer mom said, leaning in to whisper, and I also heard her husband caught wind of it. Now that caught my attention. Carly Sue Barker had been known around town to be generous with her attention before she was married, especially if there was cash or shiny objects involved. Don't get me wrong, she wasn't a hooker, but she wasn't averse to free drinks, food, clothes, or anything else a man might be willing to pay for. She somehow managed to catch a decent man named Clifford and settled down a few years back. But if she was up to her old tricks, her husband was a good old boy who wasn't exactly known for his relaxed attitude and gentle spirit. If I had to pick a murder method for him, it would likely be beating, though it would be an act of passion rather than a planned thing. Maybe. I was listening to see if I could pick up more when Sean joined me. He looked much better than he had the night before as he slid into the other side of the booth. He started to say something, but I held up a hand. Whispering a spell, I put a dampening bubble around us so we wouldn't be overheard. Okay, I said. Now we have privacy. Did you get a chance to talk to your guests? He nodded once. I did. From what I gathered, he met a certain lady in his wanderings and was meeting her for drinks, though nobody seems to know where. As usual, he'd chosen a married one. I never understood the draw of dating a married person and said as much. You and I are of the same mindset, he said. Marriage is sacred. But to people like Charles, a dalliance with a married woman works in his favor because it makes it virtually impossible for her to make demands of him. Of course, that was much more effective 300 years ago when a husband could kill a woman for cheating, but rather than change with the times, he enjoys the challenge, I suppose. I shook my head and took a sip of my coffee. Well, from what I understand, he may have picked the wrong girl to mess with. I explained what I'd just overheard. He mulled that over for a second, though I doubt he took it seriously since Cliff was human. Vampires didn't tend to perceive them as threats, which I thought was a little arrogant. After all, black widows were easy to crush with your foot unless they bit you on the toe first. Did you learn anything else from your people? I asked. Did anybody have a bone to pick with him? Sean shook his head. For once, he was getting along with everybody. He raised a brow as he took a sip of his coffee. Yes, vampires can drink coffee. Of course, we hadn't started playing cards yet, so it's mostly been a relaxing vacation. We've had picnics, a hunt, the ball. 
Nothing with much opportunity to cause controversy or strife. I'd hoped to hear there'd been a huge disagreement at his place so we could tie it up in a neat little bow. The last thing I wanted was a lingering murder investigation because the more time people had to focus on it, the harder it would be to deal with if the killer happened to be a vampire. Something occurred to me. You know, it seems that if it were a vampire, or a shifter for that matter, the weapon would have gone clear through him and out his back. We're not exactly weak. He pressed his lips together and nodded. You're right. So you think we may be looking for a human? Maybe, I said, lifting a shoulder. Or maybe a witch, due to the tarot connection. He waved a hand. That could just be somebody calling him a fool. Trust me, he played the part well. Honestly, I cared about him, but I was in the minority by far. I'm surprised he lasted this long. A shadow passed over his face, and my heart went out to him. It was hard enough to lose a friend you'd known for ten or twenty years. I couldn't imagine how it felt if you'd known them for centuries. I laid my hand over his. I'm sorry for your loss, Sean, and I'll do everything in my power to find out who did it. I'm going to go talk to Carly Sue, then figure out where to go from there. If you learn anything new, please keep me apprised, he said, his expression neutral again. Speaking of, I hadn't broached the topic of working together. I paused for a minute, gathering my thoughts. He cocked a brow at me. Is there something else? Nodding, I took a deep breath and dove in. Yeah, there kind of is. I know vampire law comes into play here, but we may be dealing with a non-vampire. I need to know that you'll let me handle it if that's the case. And also, will you agree to share any information useful to the investigation that you may learn? I'll give you my word that I'll do the same. He studied my face for a minute, and I could see his extraordinary mind turning. And what if it ends up being a vampire? I gave the question some thought. If that ended up being the case, there was nothing I could do about the sentencing according to the current jurisdictional laws. Vampire law prevailed, and I had to respect that, or the whole network failed. But... I'd still like to know who did it and why it happened, and I'd like to go through the motions of an arrest for the benefit of the humans in this town. What you do with him, or her, after that is your business. That's fair, he said, stroking his chin as he considered the implications. We have to maintain pretenses, but leaving it to you if it's not a vampire doesn't work for me entirely. If it ends up being a shifter... I want your word that it'll be death. I thought about that. It wasn't entirely my call to make. Werewolf pack law granted a jury trial just like human law did. Plus, we weren't the only shifters in town. We had bear shifters, fox shifters, bird shifters. They'd agreed to live there under my pack rules for the sake of harmony, but they weren't going to agree to put a man who killed somebody accidentally or in self-defense to death and I didn't have the authority to speak for them. You know I can't speak for the pack, or for other packs. You are the pack around here, Corey. I shook my head. I'm not, and you know it. I'm the leader, but I'm not the ruler. I pulled in a deep breath and released it. I think it's fair to say that if it was cold-blooded murder, the person will be sentenced to death. If there were extenuating circumstances... If it was undeniably an accident or self-defense, I'd be willing to defer. He reached across the table and laid a cold hand over mine. I'm not out for vigilante justice, Corey. I just want to know that the punishment will fit the crime and that my community will see it as fair. How could I argue with that? Wasn't that what justice was, after all? There was only one more possibility to be considered. And if it was a human? He puffed out his cheeks. Let's cross that bridge if we come to it. That was the best I was going to get, but to be honest, it was more than I expected. Chapter 7 
After coffee, I headed into the office. Since Joe's was only a block away from the courthouse where my office was, I'd parked in the side lot at work and walked. It only took me five minutes or so to walk back, but I was already getting sticky from the humidity, so I decided to go in through the front rather than walk around to the private employees only back entrance. As soon as I stepped through the doors, I found Ms. Ellen, my ancient receptionist and resident force of nature, nose to nose with another woman. Or as nose to nose as she could get at all over five foot nothing. The other woman, a heavy set blue hair wearing a paisley house dress and knee high stockings, looked like she was about to pop a vein. It's public indecencies, what it is. The woman should be arrested. Why? What if my Harry were to look over and see that? He has heart problems. Gertrude Wilson? Miss Ellen replied in a tone that broke no argument. You know good and well the sheriff's busy with a murder investigation. She ain't got time to listen to you harp about what swimming apparel Margot Finster chooses to wear around her own pool. If you'd keep your nose on your own side of the fence, you wouldn't have to worry about it anyway. I stopped in my tracks and cast a quick glance around the office to make sure we were alone. We were, so I focused my energy on Gertie, freezing her in place before she noticed I was there. She was a regular. If ever the time came when we went four days without hearing from her, I'd call in the medics to go check her place. Monday, it had been the mailman. He'd changed his route so he could finish up before school let out, but it meant her mail came 20 minutes later than usual. She claimed it was a breach of contract, though I never did fully understand her logic on that one. Bottom line, she didn't get the TV guide in time to do the crossword before her husband got home from his fraternal order of groundhogs meeting. The Friday before that, the twenty-somethings who lived beside her were barbecuing in their backyard at the ungodly hour of nine o'clock at night, grounds for disturbing the peace in her eyes. Gertie was one of the time sucks Sam had referred to when he declined the sheriff's position and pushed me into it. I pulled in a deep breath and released it, then gave Miss Ellen, who was doing her best to hide a grin, a sugary sweet smile. I'll triple your salary if you let me walk back out the door without having to deal with her. Miss Ellen snorted. Honey, I live for moments like this. Putting Gert in her place will be the highlight of my day. She put her hand on her chin and considered the hawkish woman standing in front of her. I don't suppose we can leave her like that for a while and put her outside as a pigeon roost, can we? Grinning, I shook my head. I'm pretty sure somebody'd notice, though I doubt we'd get any complaints. A wicked twinkle shone from behind her cat eye glasses as she picked up Gert's arm, arranged her hand so that her pointer finger stood out, then stuffed it up her nose. Miss Ellen, I said, choking on a laugh. That's terrible. And hilarious. I backed toward the door, pointing toward it over my shoulder. I'm just gonna... She smoothed her flowered dress and waved me off. Skedaddle, I'll handle the old battle axe. Bless your heart, Miss Ellen, I owe you big. Pfft, prove it in my Christmas bonus. She cast a quick glance and a wink in my direction. Now go on, don't you have a murder to solve? I do. I pushed open the door and stepped through it, unfreezing Gertie as I did. For the love of God, Gert, I heard her say, get your finger out of your nose. You're in public. And as far as your complaint, I happen to know for a fact that when you were 40 years younger and 50 pounds lighter, you was caught up at the public swimming hole more than once, given new meaning to the breaststroke in a whole lot less than what Margot Finster wears in her own backyard. Lordy. It was all I could do to leave without seeing that reaction, but unless I wanted to listen to the woman rant about Ms. Finster and Ms. Ellen for half an hour, it was best to duck out before she caught sight of me. The heat blasted me like a furnace when I stepped back into it. The quick blast of air conditioning that had hit me when I'd gone inside had felt good. I hurried to the far end of the wide veranda that graced our courthouse and skipped down the steps and around to the back door. Sam was just pulling in, so I waited for him.
he cast a confused look between me, my jeep, and the front of the courthouse. I explained. Oh, good grief, he said, rolling his eyes. I dodged a bullet then. I almost parked in front because there wasn't a space here when I pulled in the first time. I saw someone pull out and swung back around, though. I'd have been a goner for sure. Last time she caught me with a skimpy clothing complaint, she turned everything all sideways till she said I was a perv just like all men. Worst part about it is I actually felt guilty. That woman needs help. The blessings of living in a small town, I said as we stepped inside. He humphed. Curse is more like it. Look at it this way. It gives Miss Ellen a chance to keep her wits sharp. That woman doesn't need any help in that department. Her wits are already sharp enough to shred paper. He wasn't wrong. Ms. Ellen had a finger on the pulse of the entire community. Very little happened without her knowing about it. It's a good thing she wasn't a gossip, because if she were, the whole town would be in trouble. We made it to our adjoining offices. I plopped into my chair and began to pull together a case file on the murder. So what did Sean Castle have to say this morning? He asked over the divider as he checked our email. I gave him the blow by blow, and he frowned. In my limited experience, he said, vampires are pros at using language as more than a communication tool. You sure you didn't leave any loopholes he can use to get out of the deal? Not that he's not honorable, but it's good to close the gaps. Thinking back over the conversation, I shook my head. I don't think so. It was straightforward, and I believe he has the best interests of everybody involved at heart. He's in a tough spot because he's progressive and would like to see vampires work more closely with other species. That's not a popular view in certain crowds. Something tells me he can hold his own, Sam grumbled. I agree, but nobody's invincible. Best case scenario is that the killer's a vampire. Worst case is he's a shifter. Aside from being paranormals who fall under stricter laws, we're not exactly popular with a portion of the undead crowd. Colleen emailed us a copy of what she has so far, he said. Let me know if you see anything that may help, I said. I'd pull up the file and look at it later. He was flipping through pictures of the crime scene, and I almost had the preliminary report done when my phone rang. I groaned when I glanced at the scene. It was probably too much to hope that my mother, one half of the alpha couple for the entire Southeast Werewolf Coalition, was just calling to say hello. I squeezed my eyes shut and answered. Chapter 8 Hey, Mom. How's Dad? I knew that using that as an opening line probably wouldn't soften her up, but it may throw her off her game. Hey, sweetie, she answered, her voice suspiciously pleasant. Dad is fine, and so am I. Thanks for asking. I'm just calling to check in because I haven't talked to my favorite daughter in a while. How are things going down there? I pinched my lips together and furrowed my brow. My mom was a lot of things, nosy, meddlesome, manipulative, and shrewd to name a few, but she was also about as subtle as a brick to the face. This sounded more like an interfering mom call than something involving packed business, so maybe she hadn't caught wind of the murder yet. There's something we need to discuss, but you go first, I said, curious where she was going. She paused for a dramatic sigh. I'm just checking in to see how things are going with Alex. Ah, so it was a meddlesome mother call. For once, I considered that a good thing. Alex Dixon was a werewolf witch hybrid Mom had sent to help me when we'd had the rogue werewolf on the loose and I was hitting brick walls in every direction I turned. We'd hit it off, but we were still feeling things out. I counted him as one of my best friends, and I was definitely attracted to him and vice versa, but we weren't in any hurry. Besides, he still had business interests in Charlotte, where my parents lived. He wore a cerulean crystal nearly identical to mine, and for the same reason, 
We'd speculated the stones were from the same source, but there was no way to prove that. All we knew was that they looked the same, and they worked. Being a combination of two paranormal creatures wasn't easy, and it was nice to hang out with somebody who understood that. We had a ton of other mutual interests, and we were enjoying getting to know each other. Things are going great with Alex, Mom. Just maybe not on the timeline you're hoping for. We're taking our time, getting to know each other. There was another complication, but she didn't need to know that. Zachary McClure, my high school love, had moved back to town and was having problems figuring out why we couldn't make another go of it. Normally, it would just be a matter of shooting him down once and for all, but there was nothing normal about Zach's situation. Saying he moved back to town was a colossal oversimplification. In a nutshell, he'd come back to kill werewolves, any werewolves he could find, when news of the rogue got out. Since that's another story, I won't go into details, but suffice it to say, he ended up having his entire life upended and reinvented. I felt a responsibility for him, and so did Alex. We were working on it. Not to put too fine a point on it, sweetheart, my mom said, snapping me back to the conversation. But, tick-tock, I'd like to have grandkids sometime in this millennium. I rolled my eyes. You have six grandkids. Yes, but no granddaughters. I'm beginning to think it's going to be up to you or Mila, and she doesn't appear to be interested in anything other than running her shop. It's so humid and hot down there that her eggs are probably cooked, and the boys aren't coming through either. Mila was my older sister and had decided to walk her own path when she'd moved to a paranormal town in Florida and opened a cute little holistic shop. She'd always been the free spirit in the family, and though I sometimes resented her a little for getting away, I wouldn't have done it even if I'd had the chance. Castle's Bluff was home. I decided it was time to change the subject. I'll get right on that then, just as soon as I solve this murder. Talking about murder and politics was infinitely preferable to discussing my relationship status and the viability of my eggs. Murder? She said, switching from meddling mother to pack leader. What murder? I explained it to her and then told her about my discussion with Sean. The death penalty wasn't your call to make, Cordelia. I know, Mom, but as regional alpha, I had to make an executive decision. I want this solved, and I want to work with the vampires rather than against them. I stopped to collect my thoughts. Besides, it's not like it wouldn't be the sentence anyway, and I did exclude accidents and self-defense. Still, it wasn't your place to make a deal with Sean Castle, especially when it was his friend that was killed. And we're not making a blanket agreement to the death penalty. If it was a shifter, he'll be tried and sentenced according to our laws. And you know as well as I do, there may be other considerations besides an accident or self-defense. Just resolve it as soon as you can and hope it's not a shifter. Like that wasn't already the outcome I was hoping for. I didn't want it to linger any longer than it had to. Will do. I managed to hang up before she could twist the conversation back around to Alex. Considering she'd accepted most of my deal with Sean, I labeled the conversation a success. Well? Sam asked. I put down the purple pen I'd been using to doodle on my desk calendar. It seems I overstepped my authority, and she says the pack won't necessarily honor the deal I've made with Sean if there are extenuating circumstances. Ouch. He furrowed his brow. So what are you going to do? I shrugged. The best I can, I guess. I'm going to solve a murder, make sure the town's safe, then deal with the political fallout when, and if, it becomes an issue. If it makes you feel any better, this doesn't feel like something a shifter would do, he said, pressing his lips together. Stabbing's too sneaky. I'd thought about that, too. It wasn't the way I would have handled it, but then again, everybody wasn't like me. I don't know. If it was a matter of opportunity or temporary loss of control, I can see a shifter doing it. Love, 
or more accurately, betrayal, is a huge motivator and can make even the most sane person crazy, regardless of species. His lined brown eyes flashed sympathy at the possible outcomes I was facing. Let's not borrow trouble. We have enough already. Truer words. I switched back into investigative mode. See anything new in the pics that we didn't notice last night? He shook his head. Not really, but I'm still confused as to why somebody would have dumped the body there, if that's what happened. It makes more sense that the guy was killed there. It was possible the man had been murdered in the alley, but it would have been crazy risky to kill somebody outside a busy bar in broad daylight. He had a point about the location, though. We had a huge lake and miles of mountain trails that would have been better places to dump a body, so why, if he was killed elsewhere, leave it in an alley behind the hook? I glanced at the time on my phone. The rusty hook didn't open for two more hours, but Sully would be opening his doors any minute. I say we go talk to Sully. He keeps track of every face that walks in or out of that place, and with whom. Sam pulled his hat off the rack and slapped it back on his head, then followed as I headed out the door. Time to move things along before I had to tell Sean that my mouth may have written a check my butt wasn't going to be able to cash. Chapter 9 Sally's was blessedly cool when we pushed through the glass door. Even with my werewolf vision, I had to blink a couple times to let my eyes adjust to the light. Meanwhile, Sully, the perfect stereotype of a bear shifter, flung his bar towel over his shoulder and lumbered to the end of the bar to greet us. Though he'd been in the States for decades, he still had a fair amount of his Irish accent left, and I suspected he always would. It had turned into a pleasant mishmash of Irish and Southern. Marnin, lass. Sam? I reckon you're not here for a beer. He poured two glasses of tea and set them down in front of us. Morning, Sully, I said, taking a grateful sip of the cold, sweet goodness. I wish we were, but we need to talk to you about the body. His warm brown eyes clouded. I, I figured it was along those lines. I'm not sure what I can tell you, but I'll help in any way I can. I pulled a picture of Charles Vanderveer from the folder I was carrying and flipped it around so he could see it. Glancing at it, he nodded. He's been in a few times, both over the years and recently. Runs with Sean's crowd, usually Sean himself, when he runs with anybody. He's usually by himself, though, unless, of course, there's some candy on his arm. I use the term loosely. Does he start problems? I asked skipping the last part for a minute. He shrugged. Depends on what you consider problems. He's always been friendly and respectful to me and other customers, but he does have a proclivity for the married ladies. And he wins considerably more than his fair share of games of chance, though I've never been able to catch him doing anything untoward. So when you say married ladies, do you mean anyone in particular? Sam asked, taking a big gulp of his tea. Sully dipped his head. Aye, most recently it was Clifford Barker's wife, Carly. I sighed. I'd hoped soccer mom number one had been talking out her wazoo, but I should have known better. Considering they had the traditional gossip lines, plus modern tech like camera phones, they were even faster and more dangerous, and much less considerate and empathetic, than the previous generation of gossips. Was he in here with her last night? I asked. He shook his head. No, but he was the night before. He wasn't in here at all yesterday, even though he's been stopping by for lunch fairly regular-like. I started to tell Sully why he hadn't been in, but decided to keep that to myself. Folks didn't need to know he was with Sean all day. That may help me trip somebody up or lock down an alibi at some point. Did Clifford know Carly was stepping out on him? Sam asked as he dipped his hand into a bowl of Chex Mix sitting on the bar. I winced and fought the temptation to smack his hand. I'd read the studies about what all lived in open bowls of bar munchies besides just Chex Mix. Wouldn't surprise me, Sully replied, polishing a wine glass. She didn't try to keep it a secret. 
He scrunched his broad forehead. Though, thinking about it, I can't believe Clifford would let it pass if he did know. He's not exactly known for being level-headed. Sam cocked a brow, but Sally shook his head. Nope, now that I think about it, if he'd have known she was stepping out, the whole town would have heard the uproar. He's not the stewing kind. While we'd been talking, Al, Sully's cook, had edged his way over. He was a scrawny guy with a head a little too small for his body, and his Adam's apple bobbed a couple times before he spoke. Carly Sue ain't the only reason Cliff had for holding a grudge, though I'm with Sully about the Carly thing. I'd be surprised if he knew. But that city slicker beat the pants off him in a poker game over at the Hook a couple nights ago, then walked away when Cliff called for double or nothing. Cliff was fit to be tied. When you say beat the pants off him, how much you talking? I asked. His eyes were wide and bright. I didn't keep track, but if I had to guess, I'd say a few grand, maybe more. They were betting so heavy the game got too rich for most folks, and we moved to set up other games. Nobody stayed in for more than a hand or two, hoping to win one. So Vandeveer was messing with his wife and reaching into his wallet both, Sully said, sliding the wine glass into the slot above his head. If that's not asking for a man to kill you, I don't know what is. Chapter 10 Clifford owned and operated a local pawn shop, so we debated whether to catch him there or wait for him to get home. If he didn't know about Carly, then we figured it may be best to wait rather than have him lose his mind when he had ready access to everything from chainsaws to rifles. That meant I had the rest of the day to look for other suspects. Mom called shortly after we left Sully's. She'd spoken with my father and the other council members, and they weren't down with agreeing to Sean's terms wholesale. Under no circumstances was I to allow him to interfere if the killer was human, and he had to respect pack sentencing if it were a shifter, but he would get a say-so with the sentencing committee. I didn't think that would be an issue, but I needed to button it up just in case. Even though Clifford was looking good for the murder, I refused to phone it in. There wasn't anything other than circumstantial evidence, so as far as I was concerned, there were still a lot of rocks to kick. First, though, I needed something to eat. I picked up my Jeep and drove the short distance to Pickles, the sandwich shop Zach owned. As always, I felt a twinge of guilt every time I looked at it. His story would always be a moral quagmire for me because his free will had been manipulated and he didn't even know it. Still, as was often pointed out to me by those who shared the secret, he was happy and leading a normal life. That was much more than I could say about him when he first came stomping back into town, full of rage and bloodlust. The little bell above the door jangled when I walked in, and the man I'd once believed I'd share my life with stood up from behind the counter where he'd been arranging pre-made sandwiches in the display case. When he saw it was me, his face lit up, and he came around and swooped me into a hug, his tall, lithe frame swallowing me up. His smile reached all the way to his eyes. That happiness washed my guilt away for the moment, or at least most of it. So what's new in the sandwich business? I asked him, taking a minute to look around. He was still changing things up and building, and it seemed like every time I came in, there was something new. He took a deep breath. You're looking at it. I've added a couple soups of the day, along with some salads, and I'm already in the black after just a few months. The place looked great and felt... man cavey. The walls were painted in rich earth tones, and in addition to some booths, TVs tuned to various sports channels ran the length of the wall. That had started as a way for him to keep track of his sports while he was working, and it sort of morphed the little sandwich shop into a place for him and his friends to hang out for hockey and baseball games, his two passions. Word was spreading, and it was becoming more like a clubhouse on game days than a sandwich shop. Then what's the soup of the day? I asked when he released me. I'm starving. Stuffed baked potato. I'm in. I said, heading to my favorite booth. 
Bowl, not cup. And I'll have a six-inch Italian, too, please. He grinned. No onions, extra dressing. I have no idea where you put it or why you don't weigh twice what you do. You eat like a lumberjack but look like a marathon runner. Though I knew he was exaggerating about the marathon runner part, even though I was naturally toned because of my wolf half, I still preened a little. <sighs> I wish, but thanks. High metabolism, I guess. At one point, Zack had found out what I was, but that memory, along with many others, had been replaced with safer, happier fake ones. Because of his hatred of werewolves and the unique situation we'd found ourselves in at one time, it had been in the best interest of all paranormals, and his, too, to give him a clean slate, but it still sat weird with me. It was one of those situations where there were no good solutions, so he picked the lesser of the evils, or at least that's how it felt to me. We chit-chatted while he made my sandwich and poured my soup, then he came around and sat with me while I ate. It was nice having him back in town, but I had mixed emotions. He'd been the one for me way back when my life was easy and we were young. In a different world, he still could have been, but life experiences had left him broken. The problem was that he didn't know it. We hadn't fixed him. Rather, we'd made a different version of him. That alone meant there could never be anything between us because a secret like that, even if I set my moral dilemma aside, was bound to be a deal-breaker eventually. So, I was only ever going to be his friend no matter how hard he tried to turn the tides. Holy crap, I said after I took my first bite of my soup. Did you make this? It was the best loaded baked potato soup I'd ever eaten, hands down. He looked a little smug. I did. I found a base recipe, but it didn't have enough cheese or bacon in it to suit me, so I added more and fiddled with the seasonings, too. Well done, I said. As far as I was concerned, there was no such thing as too much cheese or bacon. I dipped my sandwich in it and took a bite of all of it together. Heaven. A wicked smile crossed his face when I groaned and rolled my eyes back. I think I need to charge more for it if it's that good. I chased it with my beer, one of the several crafts he kept on hand, and checked the price on the specials board. I don't know about anybody else, but I'd spend way more than four bucks on it. Go easy on me, though. I live on a sheriff's pittance. He gave me a soft look. You know you always eat here free. And he was right. No matter how many times I tried to pay him, he wouldn't take a dime. So tell me about this murder, he said. We go years and have maybe one real murder a decade, not counting hunting accidents or spouses shooting spouses. Now we've had four in a year. He shook his head. And those wolf attacks last time? That was a shame all the way around. The story we'd put out was that it had been a rabid animal, and the forensics reports, created by Colleen, of course, backed it up. The truth had been much more sinister and supernatural than that. Not much to tell, I said, shoving another bite of soup into my mouth. A guy was found stabbed behind the hook. From what we can tell, he wasn't exactly popular. He played fast and loose with the rules all the way around. He folded a napkin while giving it some thought. So you think it was a woman? My gaze shot to him. No. Why would I think it was a woman? Lifting a shoulder, he said. I don't know. A woman scorned? I laughed. Trust me, he wasn't scorning them. That was part of the problem. He loved them too much, especially the ones with rings. Oh, he said then probably not a woman, and backwood central Georgia isn't exactly the best place to mess with a man's wife, either. No, I agreed. It isn't. He thought for a minute, rubbing his bottom lip. I jerked my gaze away when I started thinking about how they felt against mine and was grateful when he spoke. I don't know, Cor. You still probably shouldn't rule out a woman, it could be one wanted more than he was willing to give or didn't like sharing attention. That was a valid point, 
and one I'd explore with Sean. As Van Der Veer's friend, maybe he had some inside information on who his buddy'd been passing time with besides Carly. A few people came in, so he had to go take care of them, then stayed busy the rest of the time I was there. While I ate, I considered his theory. I supposed it could have been a woman, but he was a big guy. I hadn't paid any attention to that part of the report, but if I'd had to guess, he was around 6'4 and 260. I'm stronger by far than the average woman, and that would have been a load for me. Of course, if it was a vampire or Van de Veer had been killed in the alley, that was another story. I finished up and took my plate and bowl to the counter. Especially considering he wouldn't take any money from me, the least I could do was clean up after myself. He saw me leaving and gave me a one-armed hug. Don't be a stranger, okay? And if you ever decide to take me up on that dinner invitation... The words hung like lead balloons between us, and I just nodded, the guilt rolling over me full force. Chapter 11 I was almost to the house when Alex's ringtone sounded from my cup holder. My heart skipped a few beats, and I couldn't stop a sappy grin from spreading across my face. He'd been away on packed business for a week, and I was surprised to find I missed him way more than I thought I would. Hey, you, I said as I snapped my fingers to enable my magical version of Bluetooth. What's up? Nothing, he said, and I could hear the same goofy grin I was wearing in his voice. I finished up, and I was able to head home. No way. That's great. When will I get to see you? In about 30 seconds, he said. What? I pulled into the driveway, and a silver beamer was sitting there. He was sitting on the porch swing, petting a contented chaos. I jumped out, warmth washing over me, and he met me at the edge of the porch. I threw my arms around his neck and gave him a big kiss, then laid my head against his chest while he pulled me tight against him. Okay, I said, pulling myself together and pushing away from him. Mrs. Burke's living room curtains swayed when I glanced in that direction. I rolled my eyes. Within the hour, the whole town would have me making out like a shameless hussy in broad daylight in front of God and everybody on my front lawn. He grinned and wiggled his fingers in her direction when the curtains swayed again. I smacked him on the arm. You know she has a crush on you. Don't tease her. Hey, she makes a mean peach crisp. As much as I like you, you're not exactly Betty Crocker. The way I figure it, there's plenty of room in my life for two women. That may have bothered me a little bit if Mrs. Burke wasn't 93. And if he didn't share the peach crisps she made him. She always has cans of tuna, too. Chaos chimed in. The good kind, not the gross stuff canned in oil. Great. My fox was going door-to-door -door bumming food. I had no doubt the word on the street was that I starved her. Alex's mention of two women brought reality crashing back, though. What? He asked, picking up on the change in my demeanor as he opened the screen door. I pulled in a deep breath and released it. Nothing. It's just we've had another murder. I gave him the rundown on the case as we went into the house, then waited for him to mull it over. He was good at looking at situations from all angles, and I felt like I was so deep in it that I may have had tunnel vision. That's not exactly nothing, but at least it's not another wolf, is it? Lord, I hope not, I said, shoving my hand through my hair. If it is, I have no idea how I'll keep that particular keg from blowing. Same thing if it ends up being a witch or any other paranormal. I stopped by to check on Zach, and he seems to think we should consider a woman. He lifted a shoulder. Maybe. With his size, I'd say most women, shoot, most men, would have a problem moving him unless he was killed in the alley. Have you considered that? I did, but there were a lot of people in there last night. Surely somebody would have seen something, so I can't rule out somebody dumping him there after he was killed. Black floors can't be that common, 
Chaos said, jumping up onto the table. Hey, I said, scowling at her. Tables are for glasses, not asses. She shrugged and stayed where she was. You try being a foot tall and trying to hold a conversation with giants. It kills my neck, so deal with it. Put a towel down. Life had been so much easier before she could talk, or before I could understand her. I'd never asked which way that worked, but regardless, things were smoother when I had a cute pet fox rather than a mouthy familiar. She fluffed her tail and continued. If you're interpreting feelings that accompanied the vision right, and I'm betting you are, he knew his killer. Alex chewed on his lip for a minute. So what do you know for sure? He asked, always one to sort details and examine them as separate parts as well as a whole. I started ticking off facts. He was killed with a wooden stick or dowel of some sort. He was making merry with a married woman whose husband he beat out of a big chunk of change at poker. The last place he was seen alive was at Sean's by Sean. He was holding the so-called dead man's hand with a joker as the fifth card. Oh, and he preferred to keep at least a few grand in his wallet, but he didn't have it on him when we found him. Chaos hummed, thinking. You also know he was a vampire and probably made at least a few enemies over the span of several hundred years. That's not insignificant. That had occurred to me, but I preferred to investigate the immediate possibilities before I resorted to digging through century-old grudges. I had a feeling if I started digging there, I'd be looking for a needle in a stack of fake needles. No, I had plenty of viable suspects in the here and now without digging back through hundreds of years of debauchery. I said as much. Right now, Clifford is first on my list to talk to. He owns a pawn shop, though, so I figured it was best to wait until he wasn't working. I glanced at my phone and realized I still had several hours before I could catch him. I needed to know whether or not he'd been at the hook, but Kat was the one to ask about that, and she was still sleeping. That left me at loose ends, but I wasn't willing to take the afternoon off when the case was less than 24 hours old. I decided to go have a chat with the lady of the hour, Carly Sue Barker herself. Chapter 12 Alex went home to clean up and grab some fresh clothes while I headed to the Winn-Dixie. Carly Sue wasn't exactly somebody with a huge work ethic, unless you considered spending other people's money a job. She'd had a few jobs and was currently a cashier at the Winn-Dixie. I made a quick call and gave a little fist pump when I found out she was working. A friend of mine, Shelley Fontaine, was the manager there and happened to be working when I showed up. As one of my best friends since grade school, she knew my secret. She'd been tagging after my older brother once when she was waiting for me to get home from band practice and caught him changing. There'd been some serious splaining to do. Carly was busy. If you call chatting up with some city slicker looking guy wearing a knockoff Rolex busy, so I stopped in to say hello to Shelly. She was counting a drawer at the customer service desk and held up a finger when I caught her eye. While she finished up, my gaze roamed over the employee of the month pictures hung along the wall behind her. Surprise, surprise, no Carly Sue. The sound of change landing in a hard plastic drawer drew my attention back to Shelley, and she smiled at me as she slid the drawer into the register. Long time now see, girl. How you been? She asked, sticking her pen in the knot of ebony hair piled high on the back of her head. I smiled. I've had better days, but not bad overall. Do you have a minute? Lord, tell me Luke isn't in trouble, she said, a frown creasing her brow. Luke was her teenage son and was in that rebellious stage. The father had walked out on them and disappeared into the sunset three years before, taking their life savings with him. It had been rough on them both. Shelley'd had to increase her hours and take a management job she'd turned down three other times, and Luke had found a hundred ways to rebel. No, nothing like that, at least not that I've heard. 
I said, and the lines of worry on her face smoothed out. She huffed out a relieved breath as the worry lines on her face smoothed out. Good. I was afraid he'd been out tagging again, even though I've threatened every store in the county with a beatdown if they sold him spray paint. Walking to the end of the counter, she swung a half door inward and motioned me through. My office is in the back. Come on in. I followed her through a swinging door and down a long hallway. When we reached the last door, she punched in a code and turned the knob. The office was decorated with a mismatch of pictures of employees and Luke, and unicorns of varying sizes and colors sat around the room. She motioned toward a chair in front of her desk, then walked behind it to take her own. What's up? She asked, moving some papers out of the way and leaning forward on her elbows. Carly Sue Baker, I said. What do you know about her? My friend rolled her eyes so hard I was afraid she was going to tip over backwards. I know she's not worth a plugged nickel as an employee. She shows up most of the time, but phones it in. If there's any effort involved, she'll con one of the bag boys into doing the work for her. Heaven forbid she breaks a nail or a sweat. Grimacing, I nodded. That's what I figured. Is she still the same as she was when we were in school? Carly'd been a few grades ahead of us, but in a town our size, if you went to the same school, you knew each other, at least by name. She's still a huge flirt, but I thought she'd given up the serious stuff when she married Clifford. Shelley squished her lips together for a second, thinking. Recently, though, I've wondered. She asked one of the other cashiers, a younger girl with low self-esteem named Gwen, out for drinks the other night, then dropped her like a bad habit as soon as they got to the hook. That was after Gwen picked her up at her place and met her husband. Understanding washed over me. It was a trick we'd used in high school to sneak out on dates because Shelley's parents were crazy strict. With us, though, it had been a buddy system thing, not a mean girl manipulation. If she had a date, I would pick her up and drop her off at the movies or wherever if we weren't double dating. No way, I said, aghast a grown woman resorted to such tactics. Then I remembered who we were dealing with. She used the date and switch on her? And let me guess, there was a guy there she just happened to run into. Shelley nodded. Give the werewolf a prize for getting it in one. Poor Gwen was crushed. In that moment, I disliked Carly Sue several fractions more than I already had. As far as I was concerned, selfish people like her were one of the main causes of strife on the planet. Any idea who the mystery man was? She tilted one side of her mouth up into a sardonic smile. One of the things about putting the screws to somebody is that once you burn a bridge, everything's fair game. Gwen told everybody in the store about him. His name was Charles, and Carly Sue was on him like a second skin the second she saw him. Well, do tell, I said. That happens to be why I'm here, to ask her if she knows a man named Charles Vanderveer, and if so, how well and when she saw him last. Confusion, then delighted scandal crossed her face. No, the murdered dude? The one and only, I said, then added, hopefully. I did not want a repeat of the way the rogue wolf situation had gone down. He'd killed three people, and almost Zack and me, before we took him down. She took a deep breath. As bad as I hate to say it, I don't think she has it in her. Not because she wouldn't stoop that low, but because it would require too much effort. Her husband probably wouldn't think it was too much work, though. Realization dawned. You think Clifford did it? I drew in the reins before that horse ran wild. I want to know if Clifford had motive to do it. That was only partly the truth, because I already knew Charles had conned him out of a shit ton of cash, but I wasn't sharing that. I trusted her, but even the most innocuous comment could turn a lit candle into a forest fire in a situation like that. She drew in a breath, then heaved it out. He stopped in yesterday to get some lunch from the deli, and things seemed a little tense. 
I said hello to him on his way in. He was abrupt, which was unusual for him. They didn't make eye contact, and he went through Gwen's line rather than Carly's. Poor Gwen was a mess because she'd inadvertently helped Carly pull the wool over his eyes. I smiled a little at that. I bet Carly was freaking out over that. Shelly grinned. I'm pretty sure she had to go change her drawers when he left. And I was proud of Gwenny. She played it up a little to get back at her. Clifford's not a bad-looking man, and he flirted back a little, too. Well, well, I said. The sweet, ugly duckling but the mean old swan in the backside. Good. Now, just to find out what was causing all that spousal tension. Would you mind pulling Carly off the register for a few minutes so I can talk to her? Shelley snorted. It's the slow part of the day when most other folks are cleaning their areas or helping restock, so it's not like she's doing anything else right now. Chapter 13 I waited in Shelley's office while she went to fetch Carly Sue, and the quasi-employee's nasally whine echoed off the hallway walls as my friend escorted her back. It seemed Shelley hadn't told her why she was being brought to the principal's office because I heard several if-this-is-becauses accompanied by a creative array of excuses, each of which pointed the finger at somebody else. I'm not actually the one who wants to talk to you, Shelley said as she opened the door. But thanks for all the extraneous info. I'll check into it and get back to you. A sputtering Carly Sue turned, and when she saw me, her lip curled. What do you want? She hadn't liked me since I punched her in the nose when I was a freshman and she was a senior. She'd walk by my table at lunchtime and grab my bag of Fritos for the second time in a week. The first time, I'd let it slide because I was one of the good kids in school and didn't want to fight. My brothers saw it, and I took all kinds of hassle from them for it. So the second time, she wasn't so lucky. Plus, it's a basic rule of survival. You just don't lay fingers on somebody else's food unless you're willing to fight over it. And I hadn't done anything horrible. I'd just gotten up and told her to give them back. When she refused, not so politely, I might add, I punched her in the face and snatched my Fritos back before she could bleed on them. I didn't even get in trouble because she was so hideous to so many people that nobody would rat me out. Before she came in, I stepped around to take a seat in Shelley's chair. What do I want? I asked, cocking a brow at her and pointing a finger back at myself. World peace. People like you to stop being... People like you. But what I'll settle for are answers to a few questions. I motioned for her to take a seat. She did, and when she bent forward to do so, I couldn't help but notice she'd had some body work done. Mostly because I was afraid one of the new boobs was going to spring out of the top of her tank top and knock her out when she leaned down to put her bag on the floor beside her. I just hoped she didn't have a glass jaw. She heaved a big sigh, more strain on the fabric, and examined a long hooker red nail as she crossed one leopard print-like recovered leg over the other. Okay, now I'm sitting. What do you want? I'm at work, and I can't leave my teammates out there to carry my load. I rolled my eyes. Yeah, okay. Charles Vanderveer. Her eyes became hooded, and she tilted her head. Who? Don't jerk me around, Carly. This is Castle's Bluff. You've been seen with him. Scowling, she dropped the pretense. So what if I have? Is it a crime to have friends in this town now? No, but it is a crime to kill your friends, or if your husband kills your friends. Friends went in air quotes because, really, we both knew they were needed. She furrowed her brow. What are you talking about? I studied her face to see if she was yanking my chain, but she was such a gifted liar that it was hard to tell. I'm talking about the fact that your friend turned up dead in the alley behind the hook last night. Where were you? I saw the minute she decided to shut her mouth. She smirked at me, and I wanted to smack it off her. Home, she said. 
washing my hair. I pulled in a breath. Okay, then. Where was Clifford? She smiled. Working, I'm sure. Then home as usual, where I cooked him tuna casserole. Chewing on my lip, I debated the merits of choking her. Not worth it, though she escaped by a thin margin. What was your relationship with him? When she opened her mouth to sass me, I glared at her. If you say, a friend, or that you didn't know him, or anything else that isn't true, I'm going to get my hair trimmed and tell Mabel I saw you buying a pregnancy test and crab cream. She narrowed her eyes. You wouldn't. It was my turn to smirk. You would. Her face was beet red, and she answered with what felt like a semi-truthful answer. He had money and liked to spend it. He bought me a few drinks and a few other things and showed me a good time. Did you sleep with him? A good imitation of self-righteousness crossed her features. I'm a married woman. Yeah, I know, but you and I both know the latch on your knees is loose. She leaned forward and snatched her purse off the floor. If you have anything else to ask, she snapped, eyes blazing, ask my Uncle Leon. That would be the sleazy family lawyer in the polyester suit with the law degree from Cracker Jack's. She turned in the doorway. But you may want to ask yourself this. Why would I kill my golden goose? He said he was going to take me out of this crap hole of a town and show me the world. She pulled back her hair and showed me teardrop diamonds, assuming they were real, big enough to choke a horse. These were just the tip of the iceberg. I didn't say anything else as she stomped out the door. Shelley came back a couple minutes later. Well, looks like that could have gone better. I sighed and stood up. Probably not, being who she is. Shelley sat back at her desk and pulled the pen from her hair. But I'll guarantee you lips will be flapping in the break room over the next day or two. Shoot, they probably already are. I'll keep you posted. If nothing else, it's entertaining to hear the theories. Thanks, Shell. I started toward the door. We're doing a girls' night soon. You should come. We haven't hung out in forever. She smiled. I'd like that. Now that my divorce is final, I'm kinda at loose ends. We made sure our numbers were current, and I left. I couldn't help but notice on my way out that Carly was tapping furiously on her cell phone. I tried to decide if she looked guilty, but I wasn't sure if she had it in her to feel guilt or shame or any other emotion that required feelings for somebody besides herself. She just looked pissed. It may have been a waste of time, but I was glad I'd come and felt her out. She was a self-serving biatch, which meant she probably didn't cut off her own gravy train, much as I'd have liked to arrest her for it. I was back to square one, but at least I'd knocked one pawn off the board. Or I thought I had. Chapter 14 All I could think about when I left the Winn-Dixie was how big Vanderveer was and how he'd ended up in the alley. I was still convinced he'd been killed somewhere else and dumped, so that meant I needed to find out where. There were only so many construction places in town, so I took a shot at the most popular one first. When the foreman answered directly, I figured I'd lucked out. There I went thinking again. He'd laid solid black flooring in two places over the course of his career, the funeral home and the restaurant at the golf course. Another dead end. I called a couple more on the list and got the same results. Not much late at all, and when it was, the location was off the radar for one reason or another. Why couldn't psychic visions have neon signs or at least instruction manuals? I texted Alex to see what he was doing since I still had a couple hours until Clifford got home. While I waited for him to answer, I called Sam. He was chasing down people who'd been at the hook the night of the infamous card game. We figured with the stakes that high, Cliff may not have been the only one holding a grudge because Vanderveer was so great at cards. When it came to money, the term, a lot, was subjective. 
The few grand Clifford lost may have just been money he was putting back toward a boat, but the couple hundred somebody else foolishly threw in the kitty may have been rent. Desperation makes even good men do stupid things, and it makes bad men flat out evil. He answered on the third ring. Hey, Sam, any luck? Not so's you'd notice. He siphoned off quite a bit of cash from the locals, but nothing anybody would consider killing for. Most folks were smart enough to steer clear of Vanderveer after the first few nights he was in town because just sitting down at his table signaled an impending losing streak. Did he piss anybody else off? Maybe by hitting on a wife or girlfriend? Just because he had Carly at his beck and call didn't tie him to her. Womanizers were, by definition, fickle. Nope, though Tara Mackey had an odd reaction when she saw him. She was in with a couple friends. When she saw him playing cards, she waited for a break, then approached him. The two guys who saw it go down said it started out as if she was glad to see him, but she wasn't so glad when she stormed out a few minutes later. I racked my brain trying to place her, but came up empty. Tara Mackey. Never heard of her. What's her story? Yeah, you probably wouldn't know her. She's around 50 and has always kept a low profile. Married, three kids, Susie Homemaker. At least after she settled down, her husband recently hit his midlife crisis and traded her in for a newer model. He's now the ex. So what does she have to do with Charles Vanderveer? That's where things get interesting. According to Sully, it would seem the last time Vanderveer spent any real time in town was 20 years ago, and she was his flavor of the week that time around. The pieces clicked into place. Ah, so she was the last Carly Sue Baker. You got it. From what Sully overheard, she was looking to rekindle the flame, but she had two strikes. She's single, and she's over 35, which seems to be his cutoff. Hell hath no fury. I wondered how much of a torch she carried. Have you talked to her? No. I was thinking another woman may have a better shot at getting her to talk. From what I gather, she's a newly elected president of the Man Haters Club. Any kids left at home? Does she work? If she had nothing better to do than stew, that made her a prime candidate for murder. Plus, it would explain the recognition I picked up in my vision. No, and no. She lives in that two-story Victorian at the end of Pike Street. That was the swankier side of town, over near where Sean lived. Nice digs. The hubby saw fit to leave her set? From what I gather, he left the house and most of the money. Though from what Sully says, he probably had his own nest egg stashed away where her lawyers couldn't find it. He made his money in the stock market. Wow. A woman scorned for a younger woman not once, but twice. That had to sting. I turned the jeep in that direction. I'm on my way. Oh, and Corey? Just FYI, she's a fox shifter. I pulled in a deep breath and let it out. That meant she'd probably known he was a vampire. Lovely. I'll let you know what I find out. Tara Mackey's house wasn't far, so I drove slow, trying to decide how best to approach her. I decided in the end to feel her out and see which way the winds were blowing before settling on a tactic. When I pulled up in her drive, I was surprised to see an expensive red two-seater sports car rather than a middle-aged soccer mom mobile. If she was going through a midlife crisis of her own, it looked like she had the cash to do it in style. The top was down on it, so since it had rained the night before, she'd likely been out already and was planning on leaving again. I took the steps up to the veranda two at a time and wrapped my knuckles on the hand-carved oak door. They just didn't make houses like that anymore. It only took a few seconds for her to answer, and I was surprised again to find an attractive woman wearing linen slacks and a sleeveless silk shirt smiling at me, an expectant look on her face. Yes? May I help you? Her tone was pleasant, and I had to wonder if she was the Jekyll and Hyde type, an utter sociopath, or just innocent. I'm Corey Sloan, Castle's Bluff Sheriff's Department. She stepped back. 
Of course, Sheriff. Please come in. May I get you something to drink? I stepped into a tastefully decorated foyer and noticed that though there were dozens of pictures of her and her kids on just about every wall and surface, there were none of the philandering former mister. Thank you, no. I just need to ask you a couple questions that may be a little awkward. Understand, I'm just covering the bases. She scrunched her forehead, then smoothed it back out when she realized what she was doing. I wondered if it was because it had been ingrained in her that frowning causes wrinkles or because she was trying to keep a blank expression. I'm not sure what you mean by awkward, but my life's an open book. She gave a self-deprecating huff. A super boring, short, lonely open book. I had no idea what to say to that, so I said nothing. She led me to a sitting room off the foyer and motioned to a grouping of armchairs placed around a round cherry wood coffee table that was probably as old as the house. The place was compulsively clean. I dusted our house using magic, and this place put mine to shame. This won't take long, I told her. I should start by telling you I'm a werewolf, so we can get that out of the way and speak openly. She dipped her head. I'd heard that. It's nice to have a shifter running things. I've always said it was silly to have a human in charge when they didn't have a clue about who three-quarters of their citizens really were. I gave her a small half-smile and found myself liking her. That didn't mean I didn't think she might be a killer. It just meant if she was, I thought she was a personable one. I need to ask you a few questions about Charles Vanderveer. I watched her face for any subtle I killed the bastard nuances, but mild disgust was about all I got. That, and maybe a little self-loathing mixed in for good measure. The only thing important about Vanderveer is that he was a womanizing asshat that got off on hooking up with young married women so he wouldn't have to worry about commitment. Wow, that was a mouthful, and she talked about him in past tense. Is that what you talked about at Sully's the other night? She huffed through her nose. Yeah, that's what we talked about, or rather, I talked about. We had a good time the last time he was in town, but I was younger, tighter, and married. His trifecta. Now I'm none of those, and he wasn't as interested in reliving the glory days as I was. You're talking about him in the past tense. She raised a brow at me. Come on, Sheriff. This is Castle's Bluff. People don't spit on the sidewalk without making front-page news some days. Surely you can't believe a murder hasn't already made the rounds. I couldn't argue that. So did you see Vanderveer after that night? And can you account for your whereabouts last night? I was right here, alone as usual. And no, I didn't see him. She said, her tone bitter. Trust me, the last thing I wanted was one more reminder that I'm washed up. Just look around at the empty house. I have all the reminder I need. My gaze followed her hand around the room, skimming over portraits, souvenirs from all over the world, and expensive knickknacks and sculptures. A set of double doors, one of them slightly ajar, led to what I guessed was the library. My gaze slid over it, but something caught my eye and jerked it back. A sliver of gleaming black granite tile glinted at me through the crack. Chapter 15 Mrs. Mackey, please, call me Tara. Tara, my mind raced trying to decide how to play it. I wasn't worried about her hurting me, the fox shifters fought much like their animal counterparts. They were cunning and ruthless. Still, I had size and magic on my side and was confident. Also, she didn't seem like the fighting type. No, what I was worried about was tipping my hand without any proof. Is that a library through there? I asked, finding it easy enough to inject interest into my tone since I loved to read and had a soft spot for old books. The craftsmanship that many old-time builders put into libraries was often impressive, too. She looked a little confused. Yes? Why? 
Not to be invasive, but may I see it? I have a love of books combined with Victorian architecture, and I'd love to take a look if you don't mind. Sure, she said, her tone clearly implying she thought I'd gone off my rocker. This way. I didn't know what I was looking for. It's not like she was likely to have left a bloody wooden something or other just lying around, but I figured I'd know it when I saw it. The floor gleamed, gold flecks in it reflecting the sunlight splashing through the tall windows that ran the length of the room. As I'd expected, the architecture was sheer art, from the intricate curves of the crown molding to the carved trim work around the shelves built into the walls. There was a stone fireplace on one wall, and the scroll work on the mantel was one of the prettiest I'd ever seen. What I didn't see was anything remotely resembling a murder weapon of convenience. A big pool of dried blood on the floor would have been nice too, but no such luck. This is just... Wow, I said, meaning it, pride shone from her eyes. Thank you. This is my favorite room in the house. She glanced around, then added almost under her breath. Or it used to be, anyway. I whipped my gaze to her. Why do you say that? She waved me off. Pay me no mind. A lot of uglies happened in this room over the last year or so, and it sort of took the shine off it for me. It's a shame, really. Not quite sure what to make of that, I said. Surely there are many more good memories than bad. Concentrate on those. I'm sure you're right, she said as she turned back the way we'd come. I followed her, casting one last glance around the room. I opened my wolf senses up and took a few deep breaths on my way out, but got nothing but the smell of old books and wood, and a faint hint of smoke from many crackling fires long extinguished. And, of course, pledge. No blood, no cheap vampire cologne, not so much as a hint of murder. Except for the owner's poorly concealed anger and contempt. Chapter 16 I called Sam on my way back to my place to let him know what I'd discovered. I wasn't sure how to proceed because I was pretty sure no sane judge was going to grant me a search warrant because I had a vision of the victim taking his last face plant on a floor similar to Tara's. Nor did she strike me as the type to wear lace-up boots, but that didn't mean anything. I owned a pair of four-inch stilettos that had been gathering dust in the back of my closet since the lone time I'd worn them a few years back. Should the need for them arise, though... I could pull them out. It sucked that all I had was a glimpse of the boots, no idea as to the size or even the sex of the wearer. As a shifter, she was probably strong enough to lift him if she had to, though it would have been a chore. She had motive and no alibi, so even though I liked her and felt sorry for her, she was a viable suspect. So if she did it, why dump him out behind the hook? Why not just dump him in a ditch or bury him on all that property back behind her house? Sam asked. Valid question. I don't know. Maybe she didn't want him anywhere near her. Or maybe she wanted to throw us off her trail. After all, we're questioning it, so it would be a solid plan. I guess, he said, doubt lacing his voice. But it doesn't sit right with me. I sighed. Me either, but so far, nothing about this whole case does. I mean, we have a vampire who by all rights should have never been so easy to kill. And we have two different women, and at least one man, probably more, who wanted him dead. Yeah, he said, his voice weary. This time around, it's the opposite of the rogue situation. Then we had nobody, now we have a variety to choose from. And add another to the list. Vanderveer took Dennis Hooper for all he was worth and then some night before last. Dennis was a quiet guy who worked in the maintenance department at Castle's Bluff High. He couldn't have gotten him for much, I said. He doesn't make much more than minimum wage and he has a wife and a couple kids. She's a teacher, so it's not like they're rolling in the dough. Exactly, Sam said. 
One of the guys who was there that night said Dennis had a little too much to drink and was running on liquid courage. When he lost everything he had in his pocket, 340 bucks, he threw in his grandpappy's watch. Oh no, I groaned. Please tell me this doesn't end the way I think it does. Yep, he lost it. Though in Van de Veer's defense, he told Dennis to get out of the game several times, according to a couple different accounts. Dennis insisted to the point of causing a scene, and when he lost the hand, they said the air went out of him, and he left. So not only did he lose what was probably bill money, he lost one of his most valuable possessions. You got it. I don't know how important that is, because Van der Veer followed him outside. The general consensus is that he tried to give the watch back, but Dennis wouldn't take it. I shook my head as I turned into my driveway. Can't eat pride. No, Sam said. But you can't soothe it with charity either. Fair's fair. Truer words. Sean beeped in as I shut off the Jeep. With a wave of my hand, I disabled my magical Bluetooth and snatched my phone out of the cup holder. Sam, let me call you back after I go talk to Clifford. Okay, kiddo. Be careful. Will do. I switched to the other line. Hey, Sean. Hello, Corey. Any new developments on your end? A few, I said, trying to decide whether to tell him about Tara Mackey's floor or not. He'd likely hear about it anyway. Somehow, he seemed to know everything that went on except who murdered his friend. Anything on your end? Not much, no. He had a falling out with an old lover, but that was several weeks ago. She's in London, so unless she flew over, killed him, then flew back in the space of a couple of hours, then she's out. Oh, the number of bat jokes I could have made. I'd forgotten he was a mind reader and was so good at it he could do it from a distance as long as there was a connection. Really, Cordelia? Bat references? Fun sponge. Now your turn, he said. What have you learned? I gave him a quick recap of my talks with Carly and Tara as I pushed through my front door and towed off my shoes. Chaos was there as soon as I did, winding around my legs and greeting. Sometimes she was the wise fox familiar, and sometimes she was who she'd always been, the one critter on the planet who was always glad to see me. Do you think this Terra woman could have done it? Maybe, I said, flicking my wrist toward the cabinet and sending a glass to the counter as I pulled the tea jug out of the fridge. It doesn't feel right, though. I'm going to talk to Clifford Barker in just a few minutes. I'll keep you posted. When are you and Alex coming in for another lesson with Charlotte? He asked. Probably tomorrow though I don't feel right taking the time while we're chasing a murderer. There will never be a right time, and with your powers, sooner rather than later is best. It stung a little when he said that, even though I knew he was right. I proved it two seconds later when I waved my hand over some tea that had dribbled onto the counter. The tea disappeared, but so did the counter underneath it. Chaos tisked, and I told Sean I had to go. I'll keep you posted, I said, freaking out a little over the Swiss cheese holes in the counter. Do that, he said. And Cordelia? Yeah, I asked, scrambling to think of a way to fix it. Focus your mind. See the counter in front of you, whole and polished, and it will appear. How the hell did he do that? That was yet another mistake caused by lack of control. I'll see you tomorrow. I scowled at the phone and wondered why I'd gotten rid of the old wall phone that had been hanging in the kitchen when I moved in. It would have been handy to take out some frustration by banging it onto the base. Instead, I focused on making the counter whole again and failed the other way. The tea came back with it. I growled and grabbed the dish towel, the one way I knew for certain I wouldn't screw it up. Chapter 17 I called the pawn shop Clifford owned and asked if he was there. 
I figured if he was, I could arrange a meeting, and if he wasn't, I'd head over to his place. According to all counts, he always went straight home after work. As luck would have it, he was gone. The young-sounding girl that answered the phone was chipper and did her best to sell me something before I could hang up. For a number of reasons, I decided it would be best to take somebody with me to talk to him. I could handle anything that came up by myself, but maybe not without magic. Since I couldn't just use it, or shift if things got real when he found out his wife was cheating, then a second pair of hands was in order. Sam didn't answer his phone when I called, and I didn't feel like waiting around. I didn't want to give him a chance to change and leave the house for an evening out. I called Alex and explained the situation, and he said he'd meet me at my place in ten minutes. I'd brought him on as a special consultant to the police department, a fancy title I'd made up, just to explain his presence to the higher-ups during the whole Rogue Wolf situation. That had been a huge mess that I'd needed help outside to fix, because the murderer had sort of disappeared. We knew what happened to him, but it wasn't exactly the type of information I could put on a police report unless I wanted to be stripped of my position and hauled off in a straitjacket. Between Alex, Sean, me, and my parents, who had as much political clout as Sean did or more, we'd smoothed the mess over, but the point was that Alex was officially contracted with the CBSD, complete with badge and fancy red bubble for his car. Though to be fair, Cat had bought him the bubble as a gag gift. While I waited, I did a little digging on Tara and Robert Mackey. Sam had been dead on with his info. Robert Mackey made his money trading stocks. There were several write-ups on him in various entrepreneurial and finance magazines over the years, and they all said the same thing. He was a self-made man who'd started in penny stocks and worked his way to the big leagues. What we hadn't known, though, was that for the first decade he was climbing the ladder, Tara had worked as a waitress and secretary to pay the bills. That seemed like a double whammy to me. I hoped she'd gotten a huge payout from that, but I had a feeling there was no amount of money that would make up for sacrificing the best years of her life so he could run off to the tropics or wherever with his brand new boobalicious bimbo. Recent articles centered around the divorce, and even though the details were kept hush-hush, there was no doubt the amount of money on the table had more than a few zeros. He came off as generous and ashamed in the interviews, expressing his sorrow and regret. It didn't quite make it to his eyes, though, and I kind of wanted to jab him for being such a jerk. In several of the most recent post-divorce articles, there were pictures of him and a dippy-looking hottie who could have been his daughter smiling from a yacht, having dinner in Paris, and attending a $10,000-per-plate charity function in Atlanta. Gag. As far as I was concerned, Tara was better off. The problem was that she seemed to be having a hard time getting past it because he took all their friends with him. I made a mental note to give her a call once this was all over, assuming I didn't have to arrest her for murder. Alex pulled up right on time, and we decided to take his car since it was already cool. Clifford and Carly Sue lived on the other side of town from Tara in a neighborhood made up of quaint ranch houses. It was a section of Castle's Bluff where the middle class settled if they wanted to be close to town rather than on a larger property in the country. I pulled up the address Sam had sent me and gave Alex directions. I didn't need my GPS. If it was in town, I could find it. We pulled up in front of a brick house with decent but plain landscaping. It seemed Carly wasn't the gardening type. Surprise, surprise. Are those their cars, or is there company? Alex asked, motioning to the green pickup and an older model yellow spider in the drive. Theirs, I said. I'd already pulled the DMV info. This could get interesting. Twenty bucks as she takes one look at us and skedaddles before we get a chance to break the news. He pinched his lips together and put the car in park. You're on. From what you've said, she seems brassy enough to call you a liar and stick to the story. After all, she's back to the backup goose, and she won't give that up without a fight. 
I hated it when he made sense like that. Chapter 18 We had to knock on the door twice before Carly answered it, and the expression on her face was smug. I didn't like it already. I suppose you're here to talk to my husband. She put extra emphasis on the word, and I narrowed my eyes. Alex looked almost as smug as she did, and I elbowed him in the ribs when a voice behind her caught her attention. Who is it, Carly? He sounded a little cranky, and her expression faltered a bit before she pulled it back into place. It's the cops, just like I told you would happen, she said. She stood back and motioned for us to come in, and I wondered what had happened to dear old Uncle Leo, the shyster attorney. We followed her into a nice but plain living room, obviously staged by somebody looking at a picture in a Southern Living magazine. There wasn't a personal touch in the room, except for a stuffed deer head hanging incongruously above an Ethan Allen accent table decorated with a vase of fake flowers. A large man, who looked like he ate linebackers for lunch, was kicked back in a recliner with a bush light in one hand and the remote in the other. Baseball replays were flitting across a big screen on the wall in front of him. Clifford Barker? I asked. He grunted and pointed to the couch sitting at an angle to his recliner. Yep, have a seat. Carly, get him something to drink. She looked like she wanted to tell him to do it himself, but caught herself and smiled. Tea or Coke? She asked. I waved her off, figuring she'd either spit in it or poison it. We're good. We've just got a couple questions. Not sure what to do with herself, but clearly not wanting to leave the room, she pulled a chair out from under a writing desk that I'm sure had never seen a drop of ink and took a seat. So what can I do for you, Sheriff? Clifford asked. He pointed his head toward Alex. And who's he? I made the introduction, then dove straight in. You're aware that Charles Vanderveer was murdered last night? He nodded. Yep. And you lost a chunk of cash to him the night before. Sure did, he said, flipping from one sports station to another without looking at us. Got me for almost four grand. Whoa, hold on, folks. We had ourselves a talker. And how did that make you feel? I asked. Four grand poorer. Another channel flip. Alex took a deep breath. Okay. Then were you aware your wife was spending time with him? That time, I caught the reflexive tightening of his jaw and the slight reddening of his cheeks for just a split second. He cast a quick, contemptuous glance at her, though I didn't think he meant to. In the span of a blink, though, his face was passive. I wasn't at first, he said, his voice neutral. But I can't say I was surprised when I found out. Plenty of people took her for a test drive before I bought her. But if you think I'd kill somebody for it, you got another thing coming. Chicks like her are dime a dozen, and she's on her last good years anyway. A small gasp came from Carly's direction, and when I glanced at her, her cheeks were pink. I sucked in a deep breath and caught the pungent smell of stress sweat coming from him and fear from her. I looked to Alex to see if he was as weirded out as I was. The conversation was surreal. He raised his brows and rolled his eyes. I guess he did. Yeah, he said. But when you combine the cash and the wife, the odds go up a little. Dude, you found out your wife was sleeping with a guy that fleeced you for four grand. For the first time, that got a reaction. Look. Cliff said, turning in his chair so he was facing us. Do I know she was messing around? Yeah, I do now. Am I happy about it? Hell no. The money's gone, and the wife's probably not far behind it. But if I've learned anything in this life, it's that shit happens. Money and faithless women come and go. Hell, I might look out the second go around and get a good one. He shifted his weight back around so he was facing the TV again. Now get out, unless you've got a warrant. My lovely wife was just about to make something for supper she'll no doubt pour out of a can or a box. 
I started to stand, but Alex nudged me, and I followed his gaze. Clifford's shirt had slid up his arm when he twisted, and half a tattoo was visible. It appeared to be a rendition of a Joker card. Cliff saw where we were looking and yanked his sleeve down. Did I stutter? You know where the door is. He turned his back to the TV, dismissing us. Carly smirked at us, but had to put some effort behind it. Things were not all peaches and cream in the Barker household. Chapter 19 Once we were back in the car, we both started talking at once. Alex stopped and let me go first. Wow, I said. I'm not sure where to start. Either he's one cold-hearted guy, or that place is a powder keg. It's a powder keg, Alex said. Did you smell the stress? It was rolling off him. And her? She's a hot mess. I'd say you owe me 20 bucks, but I have a feeling if she could have bolted, she would have. And the tattoo, I said. Would he be dumb enough to have killed him, then left the card? Who knows, Alex said. Somebody was dumb enough to kill him to begin with. Why not extend the stupidity a little further? I called Sean to fill him in on the visit and put him on speaker. He was as stumped as we were. Why didn't you reach out and try to touch him? He asked. Maybe get a reading off him. That wouldn't have been wise, Alex said. The guy's one atom away from spontaneous combustion. He'd have either started a fight or raised a stink about her touching him. Humans. Sean said, weariness in his voice. I could almost see him shaking his head. They have such a love for rules when they work in their favor, but such a brutal disregard for them when they don't. He wasn't wrong. Though pack rules were tough and vampire rules even tougher, there was no doubt that, even among a much more aggressive group, crime was much lower and respect was much higher. Human law had been barbaric in the beginning, but mostly because those who doled out the justice answered to nobody and had applied it willy-nilly or to suit their own needs. Because of that corruption, they had swung so far in the other direction in even a couple centuries that it was to the point of being absurd. Sean was right. To many humans, laws were weapons to be leveraged in order to make life work to their advantage. Still, I said, Unless we wanted a fight or a lawsuit, laying hands on him wasn't an option. So we have pieces, he said. But no picture to match them to. We're no better off than we were this morning. Sure we are, I said. We have a general feel for the people most likely to commit the crime. Colleen is testing the cards for Prince. It's moving, just not as fast as you'd like. This isn't TV. It's going to take more than a day to figure it out, and we got a good start. We disconnected and rode in comfortable silence the rest of the way to the diner. I assume Dana's is good for you? He asked. Yeah, great. There wasn't any time that wasn't a good time for the diner. The place served everything from oatmeal to T-bones, but my personal favorite was their burgers. And their biscuits and gravy, if I wanted breakfast. Once he pulled in, the comforting smells of bacon grease, frying steak, and coffee made my stomach rumble. Luckily, the place wasn't busy, so it wouldn't take long. Dana, the owner, greeted us with a wide smile, then pulled me into a hug. She was a fox shifter who'd grown up with my Aunt Carol, so I'd known her my whole life. She pushed me back to arm's length and examined me with a critical eye. You're too skinny. Get on in here and let me feed you. She tossed a glance at Alex, giving him the once over. You too, Lordy. Both of you look like you need a solid week of good meals. After shooing us to our favorite booth, she brought me a tea and Alex a Coke. Now, I have meatloaf, mashed potatoes and gravy and cheesy broccoli on special tonight. And I just made strawberry cheesecake today too. So what do you have? Normally, you couldn't pay me to eat meatloaf at a restaurant, but Dana's was different. Hers was the meatloaf I grew up on, 
and what she served at the diner was the exact same thing she'd served at Sunday dinner my entire life. You don't have to tell me twice, I said. The special it is. Make it two, Alex said. Good, I'll be right back. Alex smiled. The woman's a force of nature, five foot nothing, and I'm scared not to do what she says. I pulled my straw from the paper and stuck it in my tea. That's because you have strong survival skills. I guess so. You're lucky to have so many people who care about you. Her, Cat, Sam, your parents, even Sean. And that's just the top of the list. He was right. I bitched and moaned about my town all the time, but the bottom line was that I wouldn't have traded it for anywhere else in the world. The bane and blessing of growing up in a small town. Everybody may know your business, but there are a whole lot of folks who only know it because they care enough to keep track of you. He caught me up on what he'd done over the past week, and before I knew it, the food was there. She'd brought enough to feed four normal people and insisted we eat every bite. That wasn't going to be a problem. We tore into it like a couple of starving wolves, pun intended, and decimated it. While we ate, we chatted. Alex was proving to be one of those people who I could talk to about anything. No matter how much time we spent together, we hardly ever ran out of things to talk about, and on the rare occasions when we did, the silence was comfortable rather than awkward. It didn't hurt that he was easy to look at, too. Maybe it was the witch-werewolf thing, but the more time I spent with him, the more time I wanted to spend with him. I sopped up the last bit of gravy with the final bite of my hot roll and popped it into my mouth. I leaned back in the booth and draped my arm over my stuffed belly, but I'd forgotten about the cheesecake. Dana had not. She'd popped in on us a few times and had even sat and talked to us for a few minutes before she got busy. When she walked by carrying dirty dishes, she scooped up ours too and came back a couple minutes later with two huge slices covered with fresh strawberries and a sugar sauce and two cups of coffee. I swear, even my werewolf metabolism wouldn't be able to keep up with her cooking if she were able to feed me every day. Still, there was no such thing as no room for cheesecake. The thought was just silly. Alex dug in first. His euphoric expression gave me that extra push I needed to pull myself back to the table to plow into my slice. When I scraped the last bit of sauce off my plate, I shoved the plate away. Dana saw and sashayed her way to the table, a cat that ate the cream look on her face. Mercy, I said, holding up my hands. I can't do any more. That's okay. You done good, she said. That's the one thing about all you kids. None of you were ever picky eaters. No liver and onions, I said, curling my lip. Alex agreed. She shook her head. You don't know what's good for you. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there are enough things out there that are good for me that I don't ever have to eat a piece of liver. Just the thought made me shudder. I glanced at my phone and realized Kat would probably be getting ready to go to work, and I wanted to catch her before she did. She was old enough that she could be up during the day, but it wasn't her preference. Unlike Sean, she preferred to keep traditional hours. We'd filled Dana in on where we were in limited terms, hoping she had some insight. You know, Dana said when she brought us a couple pieces of pie to go. I know Vandeveer. And I just remembered he spent some time in town a decade or so ago, too. He comes in every couple years-ish, but he rarely stays for more than a day. That time, he was here for close to a month, if memory serves. Tara would have been involved in all her kids' stuff by then. So is there some reason that's important? Alex asked. I realized what she was saying. If his pattern held true... There was a third woman out there he'd kept time with. Somebody younger than Tara, but older than Carly. I said as much to Alex. Dana nodded as she scooped the dessert plates off the table. I don't remember who, but she'd be right around 40. It looked like we had another player. Chapter 2 
Chapter 20 I know it seems like we only have three women to look at, but I feel like I should point out that we only have three women here, Alex said once we were in the car. He made a valid point. I'd been thinking along the same lines. So you think somebody may have followed him here? He lifted a shoulder as he pulled out onto the road. I think it's something we should consider. It's not like we don't have a wide enough array, but just because you're standing in a butcher shop doesn't mean they have the cut of steak you want. For once, just the mention of food made my stomach roll. I held up my hand. Please, no food analogies for at least an hour. Okay, deal, he said. I don't know where you put it. I'm six inches taller and 50 pounds heavier than you, and I'm stuffed to the gills. I snorted. Did it look to you like I had a choice? She'd have made me sit there till I finished my supper. We finished the ride home in silence, letting our food settle. When we pulled into my drive, there was a silver Honda there with rental tags. You expecting company? He asked. Nope, I replied, scrunching my forehead. And Kat hasn't mentioned anybody either. I grabbed the bag containing the extra slices of cheesecake Dana insisted on sending home with us and climbed out of the car. Once inside, chaos darted to us, her luminous green eyes narrowed. There's something fishy going on in there, and I don't mean in the delicious tuna way. You need to get in there and figure it out, because he's conning Cat, hook, line, and sinker. She had to be exaggerating, because Cat was nobody's fool. I pushed into the kitchen, Alex tight on my heels, and was surprised to see some guy, a vampire, sitting beside Cat, his hand over hers on the table. Hey, I said, slowing before I got to them and glancing from their hands to her face, then over to his. They wore matching expressions of joy, but I was with chaos. Something wasn't right. What's going on, Cat? She looked at me, her dark almond-shaped eyes shining. Corey Sloan, I'd like you to meet Giovanni. Gio, this is my roommate Corey, and that's Alex. I gave him a tentative smile. Gio's my brother, Corey. Pink tears of happiness pulled along the waterline of her eyes. Say what now? I asked. What's going on, Cat? Her name isn't Cat. Gio said, it's Martina, Martina Bianchi. Cat grinned, well, it's Cat now. It's been Cat for 300 years, and I can't imagine answering to anything else. Of course, he said, still smiling, though he didn't seem pleased about it. Chaos had followed us in and hopped up on a chair. Her voice sounded through our mental link. Ask him how he knows he's her brother. Alex beat me to it. So what makes you think she's your long-lost sister? He asked. Cat gave a half smile. I told you they cared about me and would be protective. She shoved a manila envelope toward me. Pictures of us as kids growing up. Our family tree as recorded by our mother. It all matches. It was within three miles of where Sean found me. I looked through the pictures and had to admit that even though they were grainy, they did look like Cat, and Giovanni looked like her too. Can I talk to you for a minute? I asked her. In private? The smile had slipped from her face, replaced by confusion, but she stood and followed me outside. Not that it would do any good, vampire hearing. What's wrong? She asked once we were on the porch. What's wrong? I hissed. What's wrong is that after 300 years, some guy just shows up and says he's your brother, and you're accepting it? No questions asked? She was starting to get irritated. Of course I asked. That envelope is just the beginning. He knows the answers to questions nobody else would. Like what? Like how I got this scar on my arm? And where Sean found me and when? Where my birthmark is? and how I had asthma when I was human. That was one of the few memories she had, and it wasn't an actual memory so much as a flash of terror and feeling like she couldn't breathe. I heaved a sigh. Cat, 
None of that is information that he couldn't have gotten somewhere else. You don't know where you got the scar, so he could spin any kind of fabulous tale. Her expression was flat when she interrupted me. He said I got it when I fell against a broken wagon wheel. He was running interference when I got it, so our father couldn't hit me. Ouch. Maybe I hadn't used the best wording, but his story was actually much more effective than had he spun some happy yarn about falling out of an apple tree. Build that protective older brother bond. Okay, but my point stands. As far as your birthmark, people have seen you naked. Close up, it's on your hip so it's visible when... You know, for that matter, I can see it when you wear a bathing suit. Any vampire could have the information about where and when Sean found you, and the same goes with the asthma. It's not common knowledge, but somebody who knew the right person to ask would be able to get it. She was angry. Why don't you want this to be true for me? Why can't you just accept it and be happy for me? I grabbed her by the arm, and her emotions flooded me. The betrayal she was feeling toward me right then, but also the hope she'd felt as he told her her story after story. I do want this to be true for you. I just want to make sure, okay? There are a lot of skeezy people out there, and you know that. Let's check up on him at least before you start calling him brother. She pulled away from me. I'm capable of taking care of myself and making my own decisions. This is no exception, and you know I'm no fool. You aren't. That's why I can't understand why you're buying this without so much as checking into him. Because it feels right. Big Brother chose that minute to come outside, Alex and Chaos right behind him. I reached out my hand. Pleasure to meet you, Giovanni. I sent a request out to the universe. If my psychic powers were ever going to work, let it be then. He grasped my hand, an unsure smile on his face. The pleasure's mine. Mart, Cat, has told me all about you. I shook it for as long as I could without making it awkward, but didn't pick up anything. Well, that's not exactly true. I got an image of what I was feeling, sort of like feedback. Forcing my face into a smile, I said. I'm sure she has. I turned to Alex. I just remembered we didn't stop at the store and get milk for coffee in the morning. Chaos, you can go too. Cat was glaring at me. I know what you just tried to do. I lifted a shoulder. What? You may trust him, but I love you. That means I don't. Not until I know enough to trust him too. I climbed in the jeep and waited for Chaos and Alex. Once we were all in and buckled up, Chaos had her own seatbelt in the back seat, I waved a hand to turn on my magical Bluetooth and called Sean. We've got a problem over here and it trumps any murder investigation. I need you to get to my place ASAP. Cat's in trouble. There's some guy. The phone was dead as soon as I said she was in trouble. Sean Castle was a relaxed dude, but Cat held a piece of his heart. If this guy was lying, Lord help him, because none of us would. Chapter 21 One thing I knew for sure, Cat was not going to thank me for calling Sean. Tough. I wasn't going to let some guy waltz in there and take advantage of her on my watch. Where had he been 300 years ago when she needed him? For that matter, where had he been for the three centuries between then and now? All questions Sean would be more than willing to ask and get answers to. I turned to Chaos. Did he just show up and introduce himself as her brother? Pretty much, she said. He knocked on the door, asked for a few minutes of her time, and the next thing I knew, she was hugging him and crying. Alex turned in his seat so he could see her. Was he crying and as happy as she was, or was it one-sided? Glad you asked, she said. Not a tear. Lots of pretend crying, but not a single tear to be seen. I explained what I'd seen when I shook his hand, but neither of them understood what it meant either. 
It's not like my psychic powers were rock solid, so it may have been as simple as that. It would have been nice to get at least something that would have helped sway me one way or the other, though. Sean was there by the time we got back, and I was weirded out to find the three of them sitting around the table laughing. Come in, Cordelia, Sean said, motioning to a chair at the table. Alex? He didn't greet chaos, which was unlike him. He had a huge respect for her and her kind. Gio was just telling us some stories from Kat's childhood. Apparently, she was as scrappy then as she is now. I pasted on a smile, not sure what to do. The laughter left his eyes for a minute as he made eye contact with me, then motioned toward a chair with his eyes. Oh, that made me feel better. He didn't trust the dude any more than I did, but he was dealing with it better than I did. No shock there. He was a heck of a diplomat. He patted his pockets. I seem to have left my phone in the car, he said. Excuse me for one minute. I'm hosting this weekend, and should somebody need me, I'd hate to miss the call. With his vampire speed, he was back in less than a minute. I do apologize. Now, please continue. I'm on pins and needles. For an hour, we sat there listening to tales about Cat. Sean would ask questions and seem satisfied with each answer. If he wasn't, I sure couldn't tell. Cat glanced at her watch. Holy crap, where did the time go? I have to get to work. Gio, make yourself at home, or you're free to come see where I work. We have a fabulous Bloody Mary. We use top-notch synthetic. She may have missed the slight blanch that crossed his face when she said synthetic, but the rest of us didn't. In the space of a couple heartbeats, while she had her back turned rinsing out their glasses, he took our measure. It seemed we weren't fooling him any more than he was fooling us. I'd love to, sister. We have a lot of catching up to do. Sean maintained his pleasant smile, and I struggled to do the same. Since Kat wasn't watching, Alex didn't bother. She dashed upstairs and was back in just a couple minutes, dressed in her typical uniform of cut-off shorts and a rusty hook tank top. Ready? she asked. Ready, he said, pushing up from the table and gathering the paperwork and pictures back into the envelope. Can I get a box of your stash to go? It was a long flight, and I'm hungry. Of course, she said. Cold or room temp? A slight shudder rolled through him. Room temp will be fine. She pulled a box out of the pantry and handed it to him. We said our goodbyes, and they made their way out the door. As soon as we heard her car pull out of the drive, we all started talking at once. Sean held up his hand. He's a fraud. We all know that, but what's his end game? I'll do some checking. Corey, your parents have connections and networks all over the world, right? I nodded. And they adore Kat. My mother was a firm believer in making friends all over the world. She said there was power in numbers, though she did it for the safety of our pack and all U.S. packs, not for the power. It was always handy to be able to call in favors when needed, like today. Good, he said. I need you to send them these pictures and have them circulate them. See if they can find out who he really is. I'll do the same. What pictures? I asked. He smiled and held up his phone. These pictures. I managed to grab a few when I went to get my phone. There were five, but since Giovanni, or whatever his name was, had been sitting at the end of the table, there was only one of his whole face. The rest were profiles, but those were good too. He sent me three of them, and I called my mother. This wasn't something I was willing to put in writing, and Mom was horrible about checking her messages anyway. She picked up on the first ring, and I explained what was going on. As I'd expected, her voice hardened. I have contacts with the pack in the area where she was found. I'll contact them first, as well as the packs in the surrounding areas, and get back to you as soon as I hear anything. Sean's doing the same thing, I said. Good. And Corey? Yes. Don't let her sign anything until we find out one way or the other who he really is. Sean, with his bat ears, heard the comment and nodded. 
I'll talk to her directly. She may respond better to me than to you. He must have picked up on my hurt because his eyes softened. It's only because she sees you as a peer and a young one at that. She loves you, but she sees me as a father figure. Not only has she known me her entire vampire life, I've never done anything that wasn't in her best interests and have prevented her from making unwise decisions before. I have a track record, as your generation would say. I had to give him that. When the chips were down, I'd listen to my mother or father, or even Sean for that matter, before I'd listen to most of my friends. That didn't mean I wouldn't follow my own gut first, though, and that was what worried me. Kat had been alone all her life. She had me and Sean and friends throughout the world as well as right there in town, but when it came to blood, she had nobody. The problem was that, unlike most vampires, she had no memory of her mortal life. Sometimes she knew things, but didn't know how she knew them. For instance, she discovered she knew how to play the piano when she was messing around in the instrument store in the mall. But as far as actual memories, she had nothing. That's what worried us. Her desire to have a family was clouding her judgment. That went against everything I knew about her, because she'd been alone all her life and had that huge blind spot, she tended to be one of the most cynical people I'd ever met. In fact, she was the one who usually reined me in before I could do something rash. Now I was willing to do the same for her. I just hoped it didn't cost me her friendship in the process. Chapter 22 While Sean and my mother did whatever it was they did, I had a murder to solve. It was late and I was tired, but I needed to get some clarity. How do you feel about a run? I asked Alex. Running was my go-to exercise for clearing my head. While I was in wolf form, my instincts took over and I just existed. I maintained my human ability to think, but it was like I could shove everything to the back of my head and leave it there to stew while the tangible moved to the forefront of my mind. I'm all about it, he said. I haven't been on a good run since I left and we may just stumble onto something we haven't already thought of. We had a huge backyard with an eight-foot privacy fence and a gate that led into the woods behind the house. When I bought the property, I bought the lots behind the house, too. In theory, I never had to worry about trespassers. The woods ended up at the lake, and I'd worn several great paths down so that I didn't have to pick my way through the brush. The gate was also equipped with a latch that could be opened from either side with a paw, so we were good to go. He took one corner of the yard to change, and I went to the other, beneath a giant oak that had a bench where I could put my clothes. When I was alone, I'd undress in my room. Since I'd started hanging out with Alex, I'd started making concessions. Once changed, I took a minute to shake and stretch. It felt good to be in wolf form. I flexed my toes and dug into the soft earth and put my nose in the air, picking out the different scents of damp earth, foliage, and in the distance, the lake. I shoulder-bumped Alex, who was almost twice my size, then pushed my way out the back gate. For the first few minutes, we just ran for the sheer pleasure of it. My mind was full of the sounds and smells of the night and the utter delight in being alive. I reveled in the way my muscles stretched, pulling me forward at a pace that ate up the distance. The murder and Kat's situation faded to the back of my mind and the stress melted from my body. When we made it to the lake, we stopped for a drink and I rolled in the soft dirt, scratching my back against the pine needles and small rocks. There was nothing in the human world that could compare. Unlike some people I knew who considered being a werewolf a curse, I couldn't imagine not being able to exist in dual forms. Of course, I'd been born to it while others had been bitten. Those who'd been changed against their will were often less accepting, and I couldn't blame them. I also couldn't understand why they had a hard time accepting the gift, even though it hadn't been a gift at the time. Over the years, changing a human without permission had become taboo. The punishment for doing so outside of a life-saving situation was usually death. 
So we lived a long time, so there were still many alive who carried that bitterness. I'd recently encountered just such a man, and the experience had been horrifying. After shaking the dirt out of my fur, Alex took off on a path that skirted the lake and led around town. It seemed we were going the long way around. That was fine with me, because I was nowhere near ready to change back. I was a little surprised when ten or fifteen minutes later, he slowed to a stop behind a tract of houses. We were still in the cover of the trees, but I looked around to orient myself. We were in the woods behind the Barker's house. He crept through the backyard, keeping to the shadows, and stopped underneath the side living room window. Carly was sitting on the couch crying while Clifford paced back and forth, cussing her until a fly wouldn't have landed on her. Though it was well-deserved, I almost felt sorry for her after listening to him go on for several minutes. Most of it was just about her faithlessness and how he should have known better, but then he changed the subject. I'd half tuned out his rant until Charles Vandeveer's name caught my ears. And now they're on my trail. I figured with him dead, everything would fade away, but no. I have cops sniffing around my house. I snickered a little at how literal that statement was. And I'll likely end up going to jail for it, all because my wife couldn't keep her knees together. I glanced at Alex, who was engrossed in the scene before us. Clifford continued on his rant, though he didn't say anything else about the investigation. We were just about to turn away when he dropped one more nugget. And when they saw my tattoo, it was the final nail in my coffin. I knew they connected it to that damn joker in the cards on the body. I hoped he'd say more, but he didn't. He heaped more insults onto her until she finally broke. You hate me so bad, I'll pack a bag and leave right now. The look on her face was half derision, half fear. You keep your ass where I tell you to keep it. If you leave now, it'll just make matters worse. You already made matters worse when you said all those things about me to them. You'd have been better off keeping your mouth shut and letting it play out. But no, you just had to get in a few digs. You made yourself look even worse than you already did. That's my money, and you're not going anywhere with it. You don't deserve it, and I'll make sure of it. He growled, and the look on his face when he turned to her made me think he was about to punch her. He threw his beer can at her, but she managed to dodge it. Just get out of my sight. You make me sick. He sneered. The mention of money changed her attitude. You know I love you. I know I screwed up, but we can work things out. I said, get out of my sight. She stood, and with one final glance at him, left the room. We turned and crept back into the woods, then made our way home. Though the stop had shed some light on the situation, it had sucked all the fun right out of the run, and I was as stressed when I changed back as I was when we'd left. So much for a relaxing jaunt into the woods. Alex changed back and dressed faster than I did and was waiting on the back stoop for me when we got back. Now are you convinced he did it? I asked. He took a deep breath and let it out. It doesn't matter whether I'm convinced or not. We still have to tie him to it. Plus, where does the black floor come into play? That was one piece of the puzzle that was still bothering me, too. I don't know. Yet. But I'm gonna find out. Chapter 23 When we got back inside, I had a message waiting from Sean. All it said was to call him. Did the man never sleep? I hit the call button and waited while it rang. It didn't take long, and he skipped the pleasantries. My people have never heard of him, but they're passing the picture around. There's no such thing as a vampire as old as he claims to be that flies under the radar. He's made contact with somebody, and I'll find out who. I heaved a sigh. Are we sure he's not telling the truth? I mean... She did change her name because she had to go by something, and you said yourself you left the area shortly after you found her. Maybe he just didn't find her in time. It sounded lame even to my own ears, but it was a possibility we had to consider. He's not telling the truth. 
he said with conviction. Or if he is, he's twisting it. Kat's been visible in the human world since she got a handle on her bloodlust. She was known to the vampire community as soon as I found her. I was hosting a soiree in Venice at the time, and I introduced her to everybody who was anybody in our circle then. She wouldn't have been hard to find if he was looking. Deep down, I believe that too. If I'd thought for a minute he was her brother, I'd have been the first one to roll out the welcome mat. She deserved to have happiness. But I wasn't buying it. He may have looked suave and worn a thin veneer of civility, but beneath all that was a slime ball. I could sense it. And I talked to Charlotte about your vision, he said. Or rather, lack thereof. Why? It was just a matter of my screwy psychic abilities. I don't get a read on most of the people I touch. And to be honest, I'm glad. I don't want to know about every skeleton in Castle's Bluff. That would be well and good if that were the case, but she doesn't think it was. She thinks he had a barrier up that served as a sort of mirror. It's a simpler way to keep people out of your head. Surface thoughts are still visible, but a good actor can control those. He paused. If you think back, he kept his hands full so that he wouldn't have to shake. I believe he did that because my powers don't work the same as yours do. Yours are latent. You only see what's there. Mine are not. I can see what's on the surface, too, but I can also sift through what's there until I find what I'm looking for. For that matter, I can change his thoughts if I want, or even plant new memories. I knew he could do that because of what he did to Zack. That was why I had so much guilt where he was concerned. Sean mostly created the life he was living and the memories he had of his past. He left some of them alone, but not the ones that had shaped who Zack was. My friend was much happier, but wasn't the same man that he'd been when he'd arrived. No, I hadn't noticed until you just pointed it out. Anyway, you can slip to the hook and take another shot at it. I don't think that's a good idea for now. The man has a plan and needs her alive to carry it out. Otherwise, he would have killed her when he found her, or at least tried. If I go there now, she'll get suspicious. Let's wait to hear back from your mother and the rest of my connections. Right now, she's following her heart, but if we have solid proof to take to her, she'll have to listen with her logic. I knew he was right, but that didn't mean I liked it. Okay. Your way it is, then. After filling him in on what I'd learned about Clifford, we had a minor power struggle. He wanted to go and pick the guy up right then and question him vampire style. But I reminded him of our deal. He's human. Even if he's not guilty, he'll admit to just about anything in five minutes flat once he gets a taste of your investigative methods. I used the term loosely. Sean's way of getting information out of people wasn't exactly pleasant, but since they were usually vampires, they knew what they were getting themselves into before they landed in the hot seat. Let me have a crack at him using my skill then, he said. Are you sure you won't accidentally plant what you want to see in there while you're pilfering through his gourd? We're talking about a human, not another paranormal. He huffed in exasperation. I'm almost a thousand years old, Cordelia. I'm fairly certain I can control myself enough to take a peek into a human mind. I was sure he could too, but what I wasn't certain of was his willingness to do so without breaking anything while he was in there, or that his powers of persuasion might go a tick too far simply because his vampire mind was so much stronger. The human brain was a delicate thing, you couldn't just run through it like a bull in a china shop without consequences, intended or not. It would be the psychic version of busting a window and planting the murder weapon in the dude's car. Except in his case, poor Clifford would believe he did it too. Sean was fair, but I knew that once he was convinced the guy was guilty, the legal rules and games humans played would go right out the window. If Sean had a chance to get to him, I wouldn't be 100% certain, even if the guy confessed. Give me a day or two to do things my way, I said. Then if we don't have anything, we'll try it your way. 
He agreed, but when I hung up, I knew I'd just place myself on a timer. I had two days to figure out who did it before Sean took matters into his own hands. Chapter 24 Due to the whole Giovanni thing, I hadn't gotten a chance to question Kat about who'd been at the hook the night of the murder. That meant I either had to wait up and talk to her alone when she got home, assuming he didn't come home with her, or go talk to the server who'd been on duty that night. Considering the way we'd left things, I decided to give us both some space and talk to the girl who'd been cocktailing that night instead. When I got up, I was disgusted to see that the guest room door was shut and Giovanni's shoes were by the front door. That was going to be a delicate subject to bring up, but I wasn't comfortable having him in the house. Chaos wasn't either. She'd woken up when they'd gotten home. She's like a different person, my fox said the next morning as we ate breakfast. She's happier than I've ever seen her, but it's a weird happy. I know. I said, frowning into my bowl of cereal. That probably pisses me off more than anything. It's a dirty pool he's playing. She hummed in agreement as she finished her fruit. What's in it for him, though? What does Cat have that he wants? I lifted a shoulder as I drained the milk out of my bowl. I don't know. She's got a shit ton of money. She spent 300 years investing and she's savvy. When you have that long to follow the trends and let your money accumulate, you end up sitting pretty. Cat was a bit of a tech nerd, and when Microsoft went public in the mid-80s, she bought 20,000 shares and was still sitting on them. Just that alone made her job at the hook laughable. She did it because she liked it. She claimed she'd never be somebody who was content to sit back and languish, and she liked the excitement and grittiness of bartending. I guess when you took out the two worst things about the job, hurting mortal feet and the necessity of putting up with bullshit because you couldn't afford to tell somebody off and lose your job, it probably was a good time sometimes. Chaos agreed with me, but still looked skeptical. That's true, but why now? She's been rich for at least a couple centuries. I don't know, I said. But you can bet your bottom dollar we're going to find out. I finished up and got ready for my day, pulling my summer blazer over my tank top and jeans. It always paid to look professional, plus it hid the gun I had to carry to maintain my human persona. Cops didn't walk around unarmed. It was too early to call anybody who regularly worked nights, so I stopped and grabbed a latte and a blueberry muffin on my way to the office. I figured I'd do some digging of my own. There'd been two glasses in the sink when I'd gotten up, one of them had lipstick, so it wasn't hard to figure out that the other belonged to Giovanni. I'd washed cats and put it away, then tucked the other one in a gallon baggie and brought it with me. I'd drop it off to Colleen as soon as she made it in. By the time I'd eaten my muffin, finished my coffee, and taken care of the mundane paperwork that took up a quarter of my time, it was late enough in the morning that it was probably safe to call the girl who'd been working the night of the murder. Christina, a local bear shifter, was a full-time cocktail waitress, but she worked Wednesday through Sunday. I had her on speed dial, so I gave her a call. Hey, Chris, I said when she answered. It's Corey. No kidding, she said, and I could hear the smile in her voice. Thanks for confirming that my caller ID is still working. What are you up to this wonderful morning? Wow, you're chipper, I said. Sweetie, I'm not working. That alone is enough to put a spring in my step and a song on my lips. Now, did you call just to shoot the breeze, or is there some official or unofficial business you need to discuss? What an odd way for her to put it. What unofficial business would I have? As soon as I said it, I realized how rude it was. Sorry, I didn't mean it like that. I just mean, is there something specific on your mind? Of course there's something specific on my mind, she said. The poser dude that's strutting around calling himself Cat's brother. Christina was astute and a sharp judge of character. So you aren't buying what he's selling either. 
Oh, hell no, she said. My bullshit meter shot through the roof before he was halfway across the parking lot. I went in to pick up my check and left rather than stay for a drink because I couldn't believe Cat was swallowing his story. Good, I said. We didn't either, but he's got her snowed. Yeah, she replied, concern lacing her voice. And I don't get it. She's one of the most analytical people I've ever met. It doesn't make any sense. That gave me an idea, but I'd have to think on it a bit to figure out how to make it happen. We're working on it, I said. My folks are digging, and so's Sean. If he's ever stood out in any way, good or bad, we'll know about it before too long. Good. When you find out why he's conning her, let me know. I'll gladly take a swipe at his manly bits. The thought was cringeworthy because I'm pretty sure she'd make use of her bear claws. She could do a ton of damage with just one swipe, even to a vampire. Still, considering who we were talking about, I'd happily let her take a shot. So is that the only reason you called? She asked. I'm sitting outside the bank and I need to go in and cash my check. Oh, sorry, no, I said. You were working the night the body was found, right? Sure was. Was Vanderveer in the hook that night? He was, she said without pause. There was a backroom game going. I don't think he actually played, though. I think he spent most of his time watching. Well, and playing with Carly Sue's assets. I pulled in a deep breath and released it. Yeah, that's an ugly situation there. I'll say, she said. Awkward, too, when Clifford came in and caught them. Wait, what? Yeah, Clifford came in while the vamp was inspecting Carly's tonsils with his tongue. I was shocked and impressed when Cliff just turned around and walked back out. Was he pissed? I thought of the passive facade he'd tried to present us. Oh, yeah, she said. He did a great job of holding his cool until he was outside, but I followed him. He's a good guy, and I wanted to make sure he was okay. We went to school together. He was passing Vanderveer's car at that point and turned around and put his fist through the driver's side window. That's no mean feat, I said, especially for a human. I know, that's what's so surprising. But if you think about it, he was probably a walking bag of adrenaline at that point. Plus, he still wears his big bulky class ring, so it may not have been so hard. I doubt he even felt it. The class ring would explain it. Most people think it's easy to break a car window, and it is if you apply a lot of force to a small area. Using something bigger, such as a fist, isn't as easy as they show on TV, though, especially if the window is all the way up. So Clifford was there and caught his wife playing tiddlywinks with some other dude. Anybody else? There was a chick there, looked to be about 40 and had some serious sour grapes going on, but she was also losing her tail feathers, even though the pots were small because she kept betting stupid hands. She kept glaring at the cute and handsy couple, but I never saw them interact. Besides her, there were a few locals and a handful of tourists, and that was it. Maybe nine or ten people in all, but everybody was having a good time. You've been at the hook for ten years or so, right? She snorted. Don't remind me. I'd rather not dwell on the series of bad life choices that have landed me where I am today. I could hear the sarcastic smile in her voice. Yeah, you and me both, sister, I said. But think about this for a second. Dana told me last night that the last time Vanderveer was in town, he'd had another girl toy. She was probably married at the time and would be about 40-ish now. Could that have been her? Nope, she said without so much as a hint of hesitation. Last time he rolled into town and stayed a while, he kept time with Darlene Clancy. The hook isn't exactly the type of place she frequents these days, at least not since her divorce. Thank the universe for small favors, she added. That stopped me in my tracks. Darlene Clancy. The woman who owned the bookstore two doors down from where we'd found him. Now that was interesting. Chapter 25 
I took a few minutes to decide what to do. First, I called Rox, the guy who bartended and owned the Rusty Hook, to ask if he could send the security footage from that night so I could get a look at the woman. Next, I called my mom. If anybody would know about gossip from a decade ago, it would be her. She'd been Queen Bee of the town back then, but for much different reasons than I was. She'd been the leader of the upper echelon social circles, as well as the person pulling the strings of local politics behind the scenes. Oh, yeah, she said when I asked her about the affair. I'd forgotten all about that. Darlene and Charles Vanderveer did have a summer fling. I think she was expecting more out of it, but that was never going to happen. Because he was a vampire, I said. No, she said, her voice flat. Because he was a pig. I couldn't argue with that. Do you think she held a grudge? I asked. If she did, it's not like she could say much about it. She'd only been married a few years at that point. The worst part is that Darren gave her anything she asked for. He came from money and wanted nothing more than to give her anything she wanted. The man worshipped her. I shook my head. I'd never understand people. Since the mystery woman's been identified, that brings us back to Clifford, then. How sure are you about that? She asked. I'm not, I said, weighing my words. He has the tattoo, but I don't see it. To tell you the truth, if he were going to do it, I'd think he's more the type to beat the guy to death. So it's not that you don't think he's capable of it. You just don't think it's him because of the method. Correct. I chewed on my lip. But Sean's starting to chomp at the bit. I'm going for another lesson with Charlotte this afternoon, and I'd love to be able to throw him another suspect just to get his mind off Clifford. He wants to rummage through his mind and find out for himself. Mom was quiet for a minute. What? I asked. You can't seriously be considering that. Honey, the political balance here is delicate. Sean's good at what he does, and you're at a dead end. Maybe it's not such a bad idea. And how, exactly, do you propose we get to him? And how are we going to explain it away afterwards? Cordelia Delphine, use your head for something besides a hat rack. I hated when she said that, because it always meant she was right and I was missing the obvious. I thought for a second, then gave myself a mental forehead slap. Sean could just erase the whole thing. Wow. Okay. I'll arrange it. But what if he's guilty? Mom paused. If he's guilty, he'll be punished via human law. Tell Sean we'll make sure he gets the maximum sentence, but under no circumstances is he to be subject to vampire law. As a matter of fact, I'll call Sean myself. No, I'll do it, I said. If you want me to be more than just a puppet down here, you're going to have to let me handle things. You know as well as I do, respect is earned by making tough calls and sticking behind them. You're going to be her father's daughter after all, she said, a hint of pride in her voice. And mine, too. The perfect blend. Mom and Dad were the perfect power couple. Dad was the one who shook hands and made the diplomatic decisions because he was better at putting himself in somebody else's shoes. That gave him an edge in many different situations. Mom was the one who took the direct, hard-nosed approach when need be. It wasn't that Dad couldn't. He could be downright ruthless when it was called for, but it wasn't his first choice. She'd learned diplomacy over the years, but it had been a struggle. Neither of them were afraid to be ruthless when the situation called for it, though. I think that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me, I said. Good talk, then. I rolled my eyes at her dismissive yet sassy tone. Now, go find a murderer while I try to figure out who this lowlife is that's trying to prey on our cat. After we hung up, I gave Sean a call and gave him the news. Fabulous, he said. I'll meet you in front of his shop in an hour. It may be better to meet me at my office, I said, thinking about how awkward it would be if one of his staff came in and caught Sean rooting around in the boss's noggin. Your office, then.
While I was waiting, I called Alex. He'd been passed out cold that morning, and I'd decided to let him sleep. From what he'd told me, the pack had run him ragged while he was up there, and I figured he needed the rest. Hey, I was just on my way to your office, he said. Thanks for letting me sleep in. You didn't have to do that. I know I didn't have to, but you needed it. Instead of meeting me at the office, how about some lunch? Zax? Yep. Good. I wanted to stop in and check on him anyway. How's he doing? I realize it sounded ridiculous to be so worried about a grown man, especially considering Zack was one of the strongest people I'd ever met, but he'd also undergone a huge life change, and both of us just wanted to make sure that everything went well. He's right as rain, I said. He's taken to the new lifestyle like a duck to water. Alex paused, knowing how much I struggled with the tough decision that had been made regarding Zack. To be fair, it's not far off from the life he would have likely had if life hadn't thrown him such a crappy curveball. He was right. When we were young, Zack had wanted to own a small sports-themed restaurant, and he was well on his way to doing just that. He'd started with a sandwich shop and deli, and it had gone over gangbusters. Now he was expanding into soups and salads and had the little mini sports bar vibe going. Throw in some burgers and wings, and he was right where he'd always wanted to be. Or that's what I kept telling myself anyway. When the bell over the door rang, he turned from wiping down some tables and grinned at me. Hey, stranger. I haven't seen you in at least a day and a half, he teased. Come on in and catch me up with your life. Smiling, I took a seat. Alex is meeting me here in a few minutes. He wanted to stop in and say hi, too. A small shadow crossed his face. I knew he had mixed feelings about Alex. On the one hand, they were two peas in a pod when it came to sports, food, politics, and just about everything else. On the other hand, he saw Alex as competition when it came to me. It wasn't easy for him, but he was getting better about it. We shot the bull for a few minutes until Alex arrived, then he got busy after we ordered, and we didn't have a chance to talk much to him. He looks relaxed, Alex said, taking a bite of his tuna on rye. I bit the end off the ginormous dill pickle that came with every sandwich. I know, he's like that most of the time, but he was in a temper the other day because the delivery guy screwed up his order. That made me feel better. We'd been worrying about him because ever since his memory was tampered with, he'd been a little flat. Everybody has a moment every now and then. But for the first month, he hadn't. He'd been pleasant and impossible to piss off. So when I came in and he was giving the delivery company what's for over two messed up orders in three weeks, I was relieved. We finished up our sandwiches and I took a deep breath. Time to go wrestle a bear. Chapter 26 As I suspected, Clifford was not happy to see us. I took the nice approach first and asked him to come to my office to answer a few questions. I always felt like saying my office was so much less threatening than asking somebody to come to the station, even though it was the same thing. He didn't agree. I knew the minute we walked in that I was going to have to resort to more drastic measures. As soon as he began to put up a fuss, I whispered a few words and watched as his face went slack. You want to come to the office with me. Tell the nice lady working the counter that you're going to lunch and that you'll be back in a little bit. I started to tell him to smile, but figured that wouldn't be appropriate to the situation, especially if the girl knew what he was going through with Carly Sue. He did as I suggested, but the girl looked confused. You just went to lunch an hour ago. It's my turn. I stepped forward and held out my hand. Sheriff Corey Sloan, we'll have him back in a little bit, then you can take your lunch. She scrunched her brow, displeased, but nodded. Sean was waiting for us when we got to the station and was flirting with Miss Ellen. She was flirting right back, and I smiled when I saw it. A handsome, debonair, 30-something man hamming it up with a 70-year-old woman who was blushing like a high schooler. 
He winked at me when he saw us, then turned back to her. Miss Ellen, it's been a pleasure as always. She waved a hand at him, but was grinning. Go on, you naughty man. Behave yourself and quit hitting on little old ladies. He put his hand over his heart. Madam, you may have a few years on the younger ladies, but I assure you, your company is much preferable. As always, it was a pleasure spending time with you. He scooped up her hand and kissed the back of it. My wizened secretary scowled at him to let him know he wasn't pulling one over on her, but her roomy brown eyes were sparkling behind her bedazzled cat's eye glasses. She smacked him on the arm with the newspaper she was holding. You have business to attend to, and I'm going to get fired for standing around gabbing. I rolled my eyes. Miss Ellen came with the place. She wasn't going anywhere until she decided she was finished. I had no doubt the place would collapse within two days of her exit. It was then she noticed Clifford, who was standing there with glazed eyes. What's wrong with him? He's been into Myrtle Smith's medicine patch? Myrtle was old when God was a kid and had grown her own stash for as long as anybody around there could remember. She claimed it was for medicinal purposes, and as long as she wasn't taking pot shots at high school kids trying to raid it, I let it go. Some battles just weren't worth it. No, he's just had a rough few days, I said. She took a closer look. Ain't that Junie Barker's boy? I nodded. Yes, ma'am. I need to ask him a few questions. Realization crossed her face. Carly Sue! She was keeping company with that murdered feller, wasn't she? She was, and Clifford wasn't happy about it, Alex said. Well, I don't reckon he was. Can't think of a single person who would be in that situation. Did you have to zap him with some juju? She asked. Nodding, I glanced around to see if anybody else had heard us, but there was nobody else in the office. She opened the gate for us. I hope he ain't the one who done it. It'll break his mama's heart. Strangely enough, I was with her. Me too, Miss Ellen. We shuffled Clifford back to my office, then closed the door and locked it. I urged Cliff to the chair in front of my desk, and Sean took a seat in a rolly chair, then wheeled himself over beside him. The expression on Clifford's face was still blank, and I worried that I'd zapped him with a little too much juice. I didn't break him, did I? I chewed on my lip, watching for any sign of expression at all. Sean lifted one corner of his mouth. No, you didn't break him, but remind me to call you the next time I need an extra hand exercising the power of persuasion. I crinkled my forehead, wondering what situation would require mass control. Alex smiled, reading my expression. You'd be surprised. Bar fights, bank robberies, riots... There are a million situations where wholesale persuasion comes in handy. That was a can of worms I didn't want to open right then, because I was on the fence about the whole idea. And that wasn't why we were there anyway. Well, you're up, I said. The entire spectacle was underwhelming to watch. It was just a matter of Sean laying his hand on Clifford's forehead and sitting there. Clifford closed his eyes, and so did Sean, but the difference was that Clifford's eyes remained still behind his lids while Sean's darted back and forth like he was reading or watching TV behind them. I guess in a way, he was. That went on for about two minutes, then Sean opened his eyes, a frown marring his brow. I held my breath. He didn't do it, Sean declared. But he thinks his wife did. Apparently, he found a pocket watch that he recognized and a wad of hundred-dollar bills in her purse this morning. He's trying to figure out how to confront her about it. My mind drifted back to something Sam had said. Dennis Hooper had lost his grandpappy's watch to Vandeveer. I explained to Sean. His face went hard. Then what are we waiting for? Let's bring the esteemed Mrs. Barker in. I stood to leave, and Sean cleared his throat, then looked at Clifford still sitting there. I fixed his memory so that all he remembers is having a pleasant chat with you two, in which he told you about the money and the watch, but you have to release him from... 
He waved his hands to indicate all of Clifford. That. I'm not even sure how you managed it. I snapped my fingers, a little pleased with the compliment despite myself, and Clifford shook his head. His eyes came back into focus, and he stood and held out his hand. I'm glad we could get this cleared up, Sheriff. Have a good day. He turned and walked from my office with a spring in his step. Sean shook his head. I don't get it. You almost burned the house down trying to light a candle, but you can exercise complete control over a human being with a few muttered words and a snap of your fingers. Me? I said, pointing a finger at myself. What did you do to put that smile on his face? He grinned like the cat that ate the cream. While I was pilfering, as you call it, I realized he was a decent man. Cheats on his taxes, but who doesn't? So I gave him the gift of apathy where his wife is concerned. He didn't love her. She's been playing on his pity and goodwill, so I broke that bond. The scowl that clouded his face made me think it was a topic closer to him than he'd admit. This wasn't the first time she'd cheated, and she was dipping into his till, too, though he hasn't figured out where she's stashing it yet. I may also have planted a few suggestions of where to look. And that's it? I asked, eyes narrowed. A light bulb came on. So that's what money he was talking about that night. Not Vanderveer's. The money she was skimming. He referred to it as his, and we misinterpreted it. Alex nodded, but Sean's expression went dark, and he stalked toward the door. Chapter 27 Hold up there. Where are you going? I asked. To get the woman who killed Charles, he said as if I were simple. We don't know she killed him. We only know that she had the money and the watch. That could just mean she robbed him, Alex pointed out. Besides, I said, if she ends up being the one who killed him, human law applies. We didn't agree to that, Sean said. We discussed terms if it ended up being a shifter rather than a vampire. I sifted back through our conversation and sighed. He was right. I'd made the mistake of assuming that if it were a human, we'd have to let human laws prevail. All he'd agreed to do was cross that bridge when we came to it. Nothing else. Sean, we have to. We can't intervene. Mom said she'd make sure the maximum penalty was handed down, but it has to be done through the human justice system. His dark eyes had gone black. And why is that? For one, Alex said, if somebody disappeared right now, especially somebody that close to the case, people would demand an investigation that would eat up resources. And second, I said, they have a system in place for a reason, and the humans in this town are expecting me to uphold the law. That means finding the killer and making sure she, or he, goes to trial for it. His lip curled, but he stayed in the doorway rather than rushing out. My phone dinged with an incoming text, and when I glanced down, I wished I hadn't. It was from Colleen. Two sets of prints, one unidentifiable, one Carly Sue's. I ran my hand back through my hair, then held it back, trying to decide what to do. I had to tell him. That was Colleen. There were two sets of prints on the cards found on the body, an unknown pair, and Carly's. That's it, then, he said, stalking off. I see your point with the punishment, but she doesn't get one more minute of freedom. I couldn't agree with him more, but I needed a search warrant to go through her personal effects. Lucky for me, the judge was right across the hall. I pulled open my laptop and opened up the form, then filled the details in. Within five minutes, I was in his office explaining the details. Five minutes later, I had a signed warrant. Carly was at her station at the Winn-Dixie when we showed up. I convinced Sean to wait in the car when he refused to wait at my office or go run errands while we went and picked her up. When I read her her rights, she started crying and denying it, but when I cuffed her, she started raging. Y'all see this? Police brutality! 
The cuffs are way too tight. I have a right to a lawyer, but that's being denied me, and I want to make a phone call. I yanked on the chain between the cuffs a little, jerking her. Gwen, she said, bringing back the alligator tears. We're friends. Will you get my purse and bring it to me? You gotta be kidding me, the younger girl scoffed. I wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire. Shelley had come out from behind the customer service desk and reached beneath the register Carly sued Ben Manning. She pulled out a purse and handed it to me. Amid a ton of whining, I took her outside and stuffed her in the patrol car, tossing her purse in behind her. Thank goodness it was a short distance between the store and the station, because if I had to listen to her for another minute, I'd have been in jail for murder. Well, probably not, but I'd have needed Sean to make another memory alteration. When we got there, Ms. Ellen had the cell ready and waiting. We only had eight, and in all the years I'd worked there, I'd never seen them all full at once. Rather than taking her straight to it like I wanted to, I stuffed her in one of the interrogation rooms, right along with her purse, so she couldn't claim we'd done anything to it. Sam, who'd gone down to the hook to pick up the footage of the mystery woman, made it back in time to go in with me to question her. She was leaning back in the metal chair like a pouting teenager, glaring at me. Her mascara had run, giving her the appearance of a deranged raccoon. I want to call my uncle, she said. I nodded. No problem, but I have a search warrant right here to search your purse. Without saying another word, I unzipped it and dumped it on the table. Everything from sticks of old juicy fruit to tampons and battered packs of matches fell out, but the two things I was looking for were nowhere to be found. She smirked. Looking for something in particular, Sheriff? I ran my tongue over my teeth. There's no way she would have left that money at the house, not when there was the chance she was going to come home and find her clothes in the yard. I looked closer at the purse. It was a slouch bag with a stiff bottom, so the money couldn't be hiding unseen in the liner. There were too many bills. I peered closer at the bottom. I'd had a similar one when I was in high school. I smiled when I realized what she'd done. Honestly, Carly Sue, we did this in middle school. The smile slid off her face when I pulled the cloth-covered cardboard bottom out of her purse. As I suspected, it was way bulkier than it should have been. Sure enough, there was a slit in the short end of the fabric. I pulled the cardboard out and found there were two thin pieces rather than one thick one. There was a stack of hundreds, probably a half inch thick in between them. Well, well, I said. Looky here, Sam. He whistled, and she bolted upright in her chair, her face crimson. That's mine, she said. I've been saving. Yeah, you've been saving, all right, Sam replied, thumbing through the bills. Must be ten grand here, all hundreds. Working part-time at Winn-Dixie, it must have taken you, what, five years to put this much back? She squealed. That's my escape money. You can't prove where I got it from. Something sparkled at me from the top of a little cloth jewelry bag on the table. I reached in and pulled out a tarnished silver pocket watch with an engraving on the back that read, To Marcus Hooper for 40 years of service. I may not be able to prove right off the bat where you got the money, but I can prove where you got the watch. I stood up and motioned for Sam to follow me. We're done here, Sam. Send Stan in and ask him if he'll escort her to call her lawyer. No, wait, she said. I did take it off, Charles, but it's not what you think. He was already dead in the alley when I did it. I went out there looking for him because Clifford had just come in and busted us. I went to the ladies' room, and when I came back out, Charles was gone. I'd seen the wad he kept in his wallet, so I figured, what the hell? He was dead anyway. She stopped for a breath, all traces of tears gone. She was one ruthless bitch. The watch fell out of his coat pocket when I rolled him over to get his wallet. She wrinkled her nose. He looked freaky laying there like that, those cards on his chest. 
They'd slid off him, and I picked him up and put him back like they were. But I heard the bookstore door click, and I hid behind the dumpster so I wouldn't get caught. The little twit who came out turned her back to the body to use the phone, and I skedaddled. My phone dinged with an incoming text. Sean. He'd been watching through the one-way mirror from the observation room. S. Bring her out here. Uh Uh-oh. That couldn't be good. C. Why? S. I'll test her. But there's a camera in there. That wasn't a bad idea. Okay, then, I said to her. Come on. Wait! She yelped when I grabbed her arm. You believe me, right? Maybe, was all the response I gave. As soon as we were through the door and into the private hall where there was no cameras, Sean snatched her arm from behind, spun her around, and grabbed her by the forehead. It only took him a few seconds before he popped his eyes open again and gave a huge sigh. The thieving, cheating hag is telling the truth. She didn't do it. I handed him the cash and the watch, but he pushed them back toward me. Give the watch back to the young man and donate the cash to a good cause. He turned to leave, but I put my hand on his arm. We'll get them, Sean. Just let me do my thing. Nodding, he turned toward the front exit. I hoped with all my heart I'd be able to follow through on that. Chapter 28 Kat was home when I got there, smiling to beat the band. Giovanni was with her. They were watching a movie. Hey, Corey, Alex, she said when we came through the door. What's up? Normally, I would have given her a rundown of the day, if for no other reason than she was an excellent sounding board, but with her faux bro sitting there, I wasn't willing to spill. Alex didn't look impressed either. Nothing, I said, taking off my blazer and hanging it up. Just another day at the office. She smiled at me over the back of the couch, and I tilted my head. Something wasn't right about her gaze. It was a little empty. Realization washed over me, and I froze, trying to decide what to do. I smiled at Alex. Are we forgetting something? He was confused. I don't know. Are we? I rolled my eyes. Um, Charlotte, we were supposed to have a lesson this afternoon. Right, he answered. We were. Can't we just skip it and hang out here? Nope, I said. I promised Sean because I've been blowing it off all week. Then I realized something. Chaos was gone. Where's chaos? Oh, Kat said, her attention on the TV. She wouldn't quit yowling, so I locked her in your room. I sucked in a breath. Kat would have never done that. She wouldn't have ever even said it. I raised my arm toward my bedroom door at the top of the stairs and twisted my wrist. The door slammed open and chaos rushed out, epithets rushing through her head that would have made a sailor blush with shame. I shot her a look and said with my link, She's being compelled. Look at her expression. Chaos turned to look at Kat. Her eyes narrowed when she realized I was right. I'll kill him. Follow us, I told her, and just act normal. We'll be back in a couple hours, I said, allowing irritation to seep into my voice, because there's no way that wouldn't be normal to anybody else. I'll take Chaos with me. Alex's expression remained calm. I need to change shirts, you know, into something I don't mind ruining if your fire spell goes sideways. Okay, I said. We'll wait for you in the car. While we waited, Chaos started to talk, but I shook my head and held up a finger, telling her to wait. I didn't want Gio to pick up anything with that vampire hearing, and she'd just have to explain all over again when Alex got there if I used a dampening bubble anyway. Out loud, I said... Alex will be here soon. Don't be so impatient. Sure enough, Alex came skipping down the steps two at a time. Ready, ladies? Ready, I said, but chaos just scowled.
Once we were in the car and away from the house, I told Chaos to spill. Let's see, she said, her expression thunderous. First, they locked me in the room. Oh, and that's all I know, she spat. Because, you know, I was locked in your room. The vindictive curl to her lip did not bode well for Gio if she ever got her claws in him. She's not safe, Corey, she said. We have to do something. Well, until we can figure out who he is, what are we going to do? I felt helpless, and that wasn't something I was used to. If we were to attack openly, we risked him compelling Cat to engage. I'm calling Sean, that's what, Alex said. We can't leave her alone for too long with him. I felt like I'd been spending way too much time with that man, but in this case, it couldn't be helped. There was no way I was going to try the whole Jedi mind trick thing on him, no matter how much I wanted to. If it failed, it would put us all in danger. Since I was driving, Alex made the call. As was Sean's custom, before he even ended the call, Sean had already hung up and was, no doubt, on his way to the house. We should turn around and be ready to follow him in, I said, turning the jeep around so we were facing back toward the house. I dropped off the edge of the road so I was out of the way. Not that he's not powerful enough to take care of things on his own, but I'd rather be there just in case. And Kat's gonna come unglued when Sean releases the compulsion. I need to be there for her. No, I agree, said Alex. And let's hope he tries to get a lick or two in, because I've been dying to punch him. Rather than drive, Sean had opted for vampire speed. I about had a heart attack when he pecked on the window of the Jeep a couple of minutes later. I rolled it down. What's the situation? What are they doing right now? He asked. They were sitting on the couch watching TV when we left. I replied. Alex ran a hand over his face. I think it would be best if we went in, claiming we forgot something. Then you can follow us in. Sean looked at me. Do you think you can zap him like you did Clifford? My heart rate spiked, and he picked up on it. Come on now, Corey. You're powerful. You just lack confidence. Hit him with the spell as soon as you walk through the door. I'll be right behind you to crawl into Kat's head if need be to release her. Alex squeezed my hand. I'll be right there with you. I can freeze him, but I'm not so great at the whole mind thing. That's your gig. Even better. I said. Can you freeze them both at once? He lifted a shoulder. I don't see why not. Charlotte's been making me practice on splitting my attention, and I'm getting good at it. I snorted. He was splitting his attention into multiple directions, and I was learning how not to burn the house down. If that wasn't humbling, I don't know what would be. Chaos spoke from the back. I can help you focus your intent, Corey. That's what I'm here for, remember? Just hearing her say that made me feel a little better. Okay, then, I said. Let's do this thing. Chapter 29 We walked in the door, making as much noise as we could without being too obvious in order to cover Sean's approach. Kat turned around, the dreamy expression still clouding her eyes. Forget something? Yep, Alex said, and Chaos leaned against my leg. I pulled my power into a mental ball and felt her energy pour into me to help stabilize it. In just a split second, I was ready and gave Alex a quick nod. Rather than say the words, I gave intent to the energy directly, and since I wasn't sure how much it would take to put down a vampire, I flung the ball at him full force. He realized what I was doing a millisecond before I did it, but I was too fast. He'd barely made it three inches off the ground when both spells hit him at once. His eyes glazed over, and he collapsed back onto the couch while Kat sat there frozen, rage washing over her face. As promised, Sean was right there, placing a hand on her forehead, and her eyes slid closed. The whole thing happened in a split second, but it felt like forever. Every twitch was in high def, and adrenaline pounded through me. Since we weren't sure how long Gio was going to stay down, 
I figured physical binding would be good, too. I looked around, but all I could see were the rope cords holding the drapes back. Cheesy and probably ineffective. Plus, cat would kill me. Those were French damask, like from France. Chaos poked me and dragged my bicycle lock cable around from the table by the door. With a couple more flicks of my wrists, Gio was bound. After what seemed an eternity, Cat's eyes fluttered open and I glanced up at Sean. It was a simple compulsion spell, he said. But I had to be careful. I wanted her to remember everything she's done since he showed up in case he got anything over on her. Cat rubbed the back of her neck, and the rage that had been directed at us just moments before was now turned on him. Unbind him, she snarled at me. I want him to see me kill him. Sean took her by the arm. We need to get him to my place and debrief him. Find out who he is and who else he's taken advantage of. Why you? He shook his head. I can't let you kill him until I know for sure you're safe. She pulled in a couple of deep lungfuls of air, even though she didn't have to, and the tension left her shoulders. Her eyes fell on chaos and she bent down. Oh, sweetie, come here. I'm so sorry. In true chaos fashion, she stuck her tail and her nose straight in the air and gave a sniff. Well, I suppose you were under compulsion. Still, a steak for dinner will make me forget all about how hurt I was. Yeah, Kat said, raising a brow. I just bet it will, but you're on. Chapter 30 Sean called his people to come take Geo, and I didn't give two figs what they did to him. As far as I was concerned, they could use him for bait. It also helped that Sean had a distraction. It gave me time to do some digging into the murder without him staring over my shoulder. Alex and I went back to the station to watch the security video Sam had gotten from the hook. Sam had already watched them once and didn't recognize the woman, but we were going to go through them slower just to make sure we didn't miss anything. Somebody killed the man, and poker cards found on the body aside. I felt in my gut the answers were on those tapes. We watched them frame by frame, and I felt a presence behind me. I turned to see Ms. Ellen standing behind me, watching as we clicked through the video. Well, there's a face I haven't seen in years. She exclaimed as the focus became clear on the woman's face. I froze and turned to her. You know who she is? No, not her, she said, hip-bumping me so she could point at something on the screen. Him! There was a guy sitting at the table behind her, barely in the frame, shuffling the cards. He kept glancing up at something across the room, and I racked my brain trying to figure out what it was he was looking at. I put myself in his position and visualized the room, but all that was there was a couple dartboards with high top tables in front of each one and a pool table off to his right by the bathrooms in the back door. Ms. Ellen's voice broke back into my thoughts. That's Darren Clancy, she said, pointing a gnarled finger at the man. He's aged a lot, but that's him for sure. I know, because I used to babysit him and his little sister while his mama worked. She was a single mom, and that was a lot harder back in those days than it is now. Folks around here weren't as keen on hiring a woman. So what was Darren staring at? Christina's words came floating back to me. Clifford came in while the vamp was inspecting Carly's tonsils with his tongue. Darren would have been looking directly at that high top table where Vandeveer was making out with yet another married woman. He moved away when he divorced Darlene, she said. I can't imagine what he's doing back in town. Jenna said the bookstore's been sold. I wonder if he came back to get his cut, Sam said. You may be on to something there, Ms. Ellen said. I remember filing the divorce paperwork and being surprised when he kept a partial interest in the store. 
He'd never liked it. I wondered if he'd done it just to keep a little piece of her in his life. He was head over heels for that woman. We need to get to the hook, I said. I think Darren killed him, and I think I know what he used. I was wrong. It wasn't black tile. It was asphalt. It only took us a few minutes to get there, and I headed directly around the back. The dumpster was sitting by the back door, but my heart fell when I lifted the lid and found it empty. They'd already come for it that week. What were you looking for? Sam asked. Are you sure it would have gone into the dumpster? That's what I'd have done with it, I said, walking around to look behind it. I thought maybe it was a broken pool cue, but now we're going to have to get a confession. Sam wandered to the other side of the alley and waded through the grass, watching his feet as he did. Christina came back hauling a bag of trash. Hey, y'all. I didn't know you were back here. Yeah, I said as I tried to think over the sound of bottles crashing into the empty dumpster. I think we figured out who did it, and maybe how, but they... Chris was pulling a chain through a hole in the lid and a hook on the front of the dumpster. But they what? She said. You stopped mid-sentence. How often is the dumpster locked? All the time, except the day they come to empty it. If not, everybody uses it as their own personal dumpster, and critters climb in and make a mess. I grinned. Then we're looking for a broken pool cue, or basically anything wooden and shaped like that. You mean like this? Sam asked, holding up about two feet of the skinny end of a pool stick with his handkerchief. The broken end was tinged black with what I'd have laid money was Charles Vanderveer's blood. Just like that, I said, asking Chris if she had a clean garbage bag. Now all that was left to do was find Darren Clancy. Chapter 31 That didn't turn out to be as hard as I was afraid it would be. He was staying at the only B&B in town and confessed as soon as we picked him up. He was even wearing the black lace-up boots I'd seen in the vision. He admitted to killing him right there in the alley just because he could. Since he'd caught Darlene cheating, he always carried the dead man's hand with him as a reminder to himself. He told Vanderveer that someday the joke would be on him and he'd be a dead man. The whole premeditation thing would be up to the courts to decide. As far as I was concerned, it was a crime of opportunity where the stars aligned perfectly wrong for Charles Vanderveer and he got the ending he'd been flirting with for centuries. As far as Geo, which turned out to be his real name, he was a con artist, plain and simple. There hadn't been any big plan, and Cat was never in any danger other than losing every penny he could drain out of her. I didn't ask what they did with him, and I didn't care. Vampire law was strict, and I trust they treated him accordingly. There was a hockey game on that night, which was one of the few sports I actually enjoyed because there was just nothing like watching a bunch of grown men beat the crap out of each other at every opportunity. It kind of reminded me of my brothers a little. Zack was hosting a big game night and had invited us. I watched as he hustled, bringing out food and screaming at the TV all at the same time. He'd finally bought a deep fryer and was serving up wings and cheese sticks as fast as he could make them. Cat was just fine, and when I asked her if she was sad because he hadn't ended up being her brother, she'd said, You know what? I thought I would be, and before he came around, I was a little bitter that I had no family, but now I realize I have the best family of all. The kind where we all choose each other. Alex put his arm around me and squeezed as another round of booze went up over a missed goal. I know what you're thinking, he whispered in my ear. Oh, yeah? I asked as a shiver slid down my spine. And what would that be? Whether to order 20 wings or 30, he said. I laughed because he was right. Ready to read more about Corey and crew? Book three, Bad Moon Rising, is available on all your favorite retailers.
Keep listening for a preview. This has been Dead Man's Hand, a Cory Sloan Witch Mystery. Cory Sloan Witch Mysteries Book 2. Written by Tegan Marr. Narrated by Megan Kelly. Copyright 2018 by Tegan Marr. Production copyright by Tegan Marr.